it's time to do some coding. So, people who have been following the Space News recently may have noticed that the Hubble Space Telescope is having a spot of bother. One of its computers is failing. The Hubble Space Telescope has been upgraded multiple times by shuttle missions, but unfortunately this particular computer has not been upgraded. It is the NSSC-1, the NASA Standard Spaceflight Computer 1, and it's based on a 1968-ish architecture, and it seems to be going wrong. And unfortunately, there is no way to repair it if, if they can't fix it via software means, so that may be it for the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, I thought it might be interesting to try and do a assembler and simulator for the NSSC-1. Unfortunately, very little is known about it. However, it does appear to be based on a, another computer called the OAOC from 1972, which in turn uh, is based on the OAO-3. And the OAO3 instruction set is available. So I can't actually implement the NSSC1, but I can implement the OAO3. So I am going to do that. Here is the document with all the information in it, which you can see here is dated November 1968. It is surprisingly small, 82 pages, and a lot of that is documenting the assembler. It's got, what, 30-odd instructions and an orth uh, orthogonal instruction set with 18-bit words. Uh, th this assembler is supposed to assemble from punch tape or cards. Uh, somewhere here it actually lists the number of instructions, which I cannot find. Anyway, I am not going to duplicate this assembler because it's really weird. Here's an example of some of the source code it actually accepts. And yes, this looks like English text. Let x times x yield x squared. Let y times y plus x squared transformed by square root yield norm. If norm is not greater than 1, then go to compute inside the unit circle. Otherwise, etc, etc. Uh, the instructions have two forms, the three-letter mnemonics and extended English descriptions. Here's the list of instructions. So uh, let turns into the LDA instruction and so on. Let location of is a load effective address. Uh, people have been trying for years to do natural language programming in, in English and it always turns out to be a terrible, terrible idea. So I'm going to implement the uh, the machine language form only. And because I'm doing this in a hurry, it's going to be bolted onto my existing Calgol assembler architecture. I've got here the 6303 assembler, which is really simple. So it's basically going to be much the same. Uh, the simulator itself is going to be in C, because I want that to be more useful to other people. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, the architecture has 50 instructions, 30 of which require a memory access, the other 20 of which uh, are simple instructions that don't take a parameter. There are only two instruction forms. So this is one that takes a memory address. So we have uh, a 12-bit operand field, a 5-bit uh, opcode field, and 1-bit to indicate whether the, uh, the value in the operand gets subscripted through the indirection register. Uh, it's got a single accumulator, which is 18 bits wide, uh, there is another accumulator that's used for double width uh, operations, but it's not really a general purpose accumulator. Uh, subscript register, which is used for indirecting pointers. 
uh, a scale register which is used to do uh, fixed point arithmetic and a few other minor things and that's basically it. So, first thing to do is let's just copy the copy and paste the entire six three three assembler, and that assembles there. And let's just strip out some of the six three zero three stuff. Let's actually change this to O A O three assembler. Copyright twenty twenty. 2021. Uh, there are no register symbols in use in the instruction set. The register is always going to be part of the opcode itself. Uh, it, it, the register parameter is implicit, so we don't need any of them. All instructions are very similar. Uh, there's actually only two forms. There's going to be the simple form and the noun form. Uh, noun in the uh, terminology used by this document is referring to a memory location. However, it doesn't quite work the way you might think. So for things like LDA, that loads the value at uh, noun. However, so the the uh, the value at that address gets loaded. However, if we go and look at, for example, where's a branch instruction? Here we go. Uh, this is part of this is a conditional a uh, branch instruction. Uh, if the content of the decision register, which is a single bit, that is the result of the last comparison, uh, is 1, then the content of the storage at the effective address is placed in the instruction counter. So this doesn't jump to noun, it jumps to the value held at noun. Noun is a variable containing an address. And even things like simple go to are, work like that, which is going to make programming a little bit weird by today's standards. I believe that this assembler uh, would automatically allocate a word of memory for use to contain a address in for control flow. I have yet to spot any instructions that actually work with the address of noun other than LDL uh, load location which loads the effect loads the address of noun into the accumulator register A. Here you can see the instruction format which is uh, 18 bits wide, which is six 3-bit octal nibbles, I think you call them. So the whole thing is supposed to be operated in octal. Uh, and uh, the only addressing mode is whether the subscription bit is set. This bit here. Now, I would like to find out what the syntax is. Oh yeah, XED. To indicate that uh, the value is supposed to be subscripted. I don't like that, so I'm writing the assembler so I can make up my own syntax. I'm just going to use, uh, I think, square brackets so that that matches the way other assemblers work. You're not going to be able to assemble traditional uh, OEO3 source code, assuming any survives, with this assembler. Okay, so let's just stick in uh, here. Are, these are the, the opcode handlers for the uh, 
6303. So let's chop out all of these except simple. Simple is the case where no parameters are taken. Um, because the OAO3 is an 18-bit machine, we can't write out the result in bytes very easily. So we're going to have to write each instruction as a 32-bit word with uh, 14 of the bits wasted. But that's fine, not a real problem. Oh yes, and I also don't want a bit. I don't want this. Convert ext to dear. That's another 603 thing. I don't want that. Don't want that. Read operand. This is. Uh, this is the code that reads a 6303 value, which can either be a register, a immediate number, or uh, an indirectant thing. So we're going to have to replace this. Um, so values that we can read are going to be Let me actually make a test file. Oh, this is the test file I did for my last assembler, if you don't need any more. Okay, so let's add two numbers. The way you're supposed to do it is value A, uh, I think add, here we go, add value B, STA result. Using the English syntax that would probably be uh, let value A plus value B yield result. Now value A is going to be a these are going to be constants in memory and result is going to be just a word to put the result into. So that we can see that there's now two types of value. There's immediate, which are these, and there is addresses. So value A, value B, and result are all going to assemble into addresses pointing at these. So If we're going to want to do an indirection, that is, we want to read from a table, let me see how this works. Uh, indexing is specified by using either subscripted or XED between the verb and the mnemonic and the noun or memory location. LDA XED number will result in load accumulate instruction so that the subscript register will be added to the address field at execution time to form the effective address. So number in this case is actually going to be a table like so. So to use that you're going to load the uh, the indirection register which is x with with, here we go, LDX loads the subscript register. This will load X with 2. We then load A using this, the indirection syntax, which will add 2 to table. So 0, 1, 2, that will produce 6. And then we're going to add on 4, and the result 10 will be written here. Okay, so that will work. Uh, with this syntax, it is going to be possible to do something like this, which is not going to do what you want. It's not going to load 4 into the 
uh, into X, it's going to load whatever's at address 4, which is not necessarily what you want. A very simple extension to the assembler would be to add constant pool support. So if you did this, then the assembler would allocate a address to put the 4 in and substitute that address here in the instruction. That would make coding much, much simpler. I'm not going to do that for now. All right. So so the only case we care about is is the is the token we're reading a square bracket? If so, it's going to be an indirection. So let's just stub that out for the time being. Otherwise, it's a expression. Uh, we do need to be able to tell the the opcode handler routine, whether it's a address or an indirected address. We don't have addressing modes anymore. So addressing mode equals, uh, that's just a simple address. Actually, let's call this a value. We don't need any of that. Okay, what happens when we try and compile this? Right, we haven't done our emit32. Uh, actually, 18 bits will fit nicely into 24. It'll waste the top six bits of the high byte, but that's fine. Yeah, what am I doing? So, we've got to write it out. Little endian. Like so. Eight twenty-four. 24. Uh. Ah, ah. Um, emit 16 is part of the, the framework code. Right. Yeah, the fr my framework, unfortunately, is written to expect that words are 16 bits. Um, we really want to get rid of emit 8 as well. Uh, this, is, this architecture can only address words. It can't address bytes. So, yeah, I was slightly too clever for my own good when I factored all this stuff out. Well, emit 16 is only used in one place, which is define word. We do need to implement it, otherwise it won't work. So for the time being, I'm going to pretend that 16-bit values, well, I'm going to pretend that 18-bit values are 16 bits wide. So I'm going to write out my instructions with emit 16. This is going to need some proper work later to fix it a bit. And of course, ah, I can't do that. Okay, I'm just going to define my own routine for emit 24. Like so. Uh, yep. But I still need to implement 
uh, emit 16, which is just going to produce a and use DW on this architecture. Just going to produce a error. Been a while since I touched this code. Uh, that should be impl. Okay. Right, so our assembler, which is this, compiles. But it won't work. Let me. So these are going to want to be longs. Uh, yeah, we really want these to be w for word, but. Let's go with long for the time being. So it should be able to run my assembler. And it fails on line one because I haven't actually added any instructions yet. All right. So we're going to start with the simple instructions. They're called simple because they don't take any parameters. It's just a single word which writes out a single uh, value to the output stream. So how are they going to work? Let's start from the top. STA, LDE, STE, add, mul, div. Yes, hardware multiplication and divide in the 1968 architecture. This thing is noticeably more sophisticated than the Apollo guidance computer. It's amazing how quickly the state of the art was progressing, given that this is dated 1968, and the AGC flew in all the Apollo missions. Of course, Apollo 11 was 1969, so the AGC was in use after this machine was designed. Right, ADC is the first one. That adds the carry bit to the accumulator. Oh, 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 006. Neg, negate. Uh, there should be a number here. Interesting. Let's see if that appears anywhere else in the document. No, it doesn't. There's a there are some program listings down here. I'm going to look to see if there's a either a summary document or can I rotate this? Yes, I can. Looking for a summary document or else a disassembly with a negate instruction in it. Yeah, this is more source code. So Defining for external use factorial defines a uh, exported label. If it is less than zero, then go to uh, brackets return from factorial. So if it, the accumulator, is less than zero, then return. Uh, if it is equal to zero, then go to answer equals one. Answer equals one is a label defined down here, and so on. This looks great. I mean, you read it and you think you understand it. The problem is that it's still a machine language. And if you phrase one of these sentences in a way that still makes perfectly good English sense, but isn't phrased exactly the way the very simple-minded assembler wanted it, then your program doesn't work. So here is the program split, broken up into instructions. Is there a negated? It's a minus one. Don't think there is. 
Oh, it doesn't do have a proper dump. This looks like a program dump. No negation, no negation, I believe this is the address and these three bytes here are not the opcode. Uh, the, the the listing is to find elsewhere in the document, so if I find one of these things, I'll go and look for it. Salt jail. Uh, yield let blah 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 blah. Minus. Um. Not using the gate. Someone must use the gate. Right, uh, possibly we're stuffed. It may be possible to determine what the gate should be from looking to see which instructions aren't used. Okay, well, let's go back to our instruction list. Ignore that for the time being. Uh, okay, neg, negate. That takes a. These will all take verbs. CMP, complemented. Is. 00010. Ah. 00010. Cycle, double cycle, normalize. Normalize is interesting. You give it a integer. It keeps shifting the integer left until it looks like a uh, until the leftmost bit. Well, you can look at the instructions here. Look at the description here. Uh, it's shifted left until the 17th and 18th bit, 18th bits of the accumulator are different. So uh, the uh, accumulator and extended accumulator. So what this will do is it will keep shifting a 36-bit number until uh, it represents a fraction that is a fixed point number between 0 and 1 and it will also keep track in the scale register of how far it shifted it. So this was very useful for doing anything with uh, Fractional values and floating point. So, ops, which I don't intend to. Okay, LDD, close extension with decision. Uh, shifts left one and copies the value of the decision register into the bottom bit. Flip reverses the order of the bits, which is 22. Uh, the OO prefix here indicates octal. LDX, STX, ADX, Brook, Brew, Broom, and an OR. Now, these don't and an OR values, what they do is set the and OR register which is used for chaining together multiple comparisons because I'm not sure actually uh, when you are assembling conditional operations you know if, if x equals 1 and y equals 2 the way we do it these days is we use uh, trees of conditionals 
uh, the way this architecture is designed to do designed to do it is you execute all the uh, the all the actual comparisons uh, and you use and and or to indicate whether the to indicate how the comparisons are compounded together so it doesn't do any short circuiting of unused expressions which makes for slower code but easier to understand I think and possibly smaller so one five ILT IET IGT uh, these do a uh, these do a comparison but rather than doing a branch they update the decision register okay if overflow of over O one uh, if parity odd IOP is O five is positive IGZ is O three is equal to zero I EZ is to one. Uh, takes a verb CPD uh, one seven not. is O2. Okay, let's put these in numerical order. See if anything comes to mind. I don't see a 7. 10, 11, no, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17, one IGZ and IOP really you know, five and O three. Hmm. Yeah, I can't really make anything of that. It's possible this architecture is microcoded, in which case the the arrangement of the instructions won't mean anything. But uh, I still don't see a negate. Uh, NOP is the... No, no, not the last instruction. Huh, that's what it was. Never mind. So HALT is zero, stops and waits for a external interrupt. SSA, set the scale register. That's the one that's used for... Uh, Fixed point operations, set page LDP uh, allows. Uh, so there's twelve bits of. Uh, that's interesting. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, eighteen-bit instructions, but address parameters go in the bottom four nibbles, which in octal is twelve bits. So the page register is used to indicate which page of memory you are referring to with those four digits. Twelve. Rov reset the overflow is seven. Red reset the decision bit is twenty three. Exit uh, 
Uh, fires a particular interrupt. Interesting. I've read on. I've read the in, the interrupt section, but I forget what interrupt sixteen is supposed to do. This might be the system call instruction, but honestly, I think this architecture is a bit too simple for system calls. Okay, tin IO, which is doing for all IO operations. That is the end, right? So what do we got? One, two, three, missing four, five, six, seven. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 20, 21, 22, 23. I am going to make an executive decision that neg is four, because there's an obvious hole there. And it looks like they've been allocating instructions from zero up. So single hole, single instruction that we don't know what it is. Right. Now let's go back to the top. And let's do the other ones. Um, So, LDA, load the accumulator. Two, zero, one, two, three, four. Op, noun, CB. LDL, load the effective address is four, zero. STA, store the accumulator. LDE, load the E register. This is the, the extended accumulator. That is 52. STE, store the E register is 10. Add is 04. Mull is four four. Div is six four. It would be really cool at some point to port Calgol to this architecture. That won't be today. Uh, it's quite small. It can it can only access I think it's four killer words. So you're not going to be running the compiler in one of these machines. It is a true von Neumann architecture, so the instructions are read from the same address space as the data. Uh, there's a really interesting instruction that reads a value from a variable and then treats the value as an instruction and executes it. Not sure what that's supposed to be doing, but uh, I've done that one. This is possibly our four. ETR. This is the one that actually ands values. That's three zero. Three zero. Mrug. This is or is fifty. Eor, which is actually surprisingly Eor, is 70. Uh, done that one. The shift instruction, which shifts in both directions, is 1, 4. Shifts in one direction if positive, in the other direction if negative. Uh, positive is left. Uh, double shift is three six. Uh, 
which shifts both the accumulator and the e-register together. Just looking at the comparative speeds. Yeah, shift and double shift both take exactly the same amount of time, even though they're doing uh, double shift is doing twice the work. Uh, three six cycle, which is rotate, is three four. Double cycle is five six. You probably guess what that does. Normalize LDD flip LDX is five four. STX is seven four. Uh, step subscript, which add, lets you add to the X register directly, is O two. Uh, okay, these are the branch instructions. So, Brook is 42, which is unconditional branch. Uh, no, Brook is conditional branch. Brew is unconditional branch, which is 62. Uh, broom is content and instruction counter plus one is stored at the effective address. The content of one location greater than oh right, this is the jump to subroutine uh, instruction. Now this machine has no stack. This means that saving the return address. It's difficult. You can't just push the return address onto the stack. Instead, what you do is uh, the return address is stored at the address given. Hang on. Okay. I need to try and get my head around the various levels of indirections. So the content instruction counter plus one is the return address. It is stored at noun. Okay, so the thing you actually give it is a variable in memory. The content of one location greater than the effective address is placed into the instruction counter. Right. So you call Brum. You give it uh, as the effective address the location before the subroutine and the return address is written into that location. So to return from the subroutine, you use brew here, also called return from, which loads the return address and jumps there. So you have one level of subroutine calls. You can't do anything recursively. Uh, this actually suits my Calgol language right down to the ground. This is exactly the kind of architecture that Calgol was designed for. Okay, uh, had we done Brum? Brum is 06. Okay, and or if less than is 26, which goes here. Less than two six uh, is equal to is four six is greater than is six six. There's obviously a pattern here. Uh, done, 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 done. Uh, X N G T. If subscript is not greater than. If the content of the subscript register is less than or equal to the content of the storage at the address, uh, then do the test stuff. Okay, this is this goes with ADX. This allows you to write loops using where the loop counter is the X register. 
you use ADX to increment it and XNGT, which is 2 2. To test for the end of the loop. Uh, done, done, done. Execute. This is the one that executes an instruction. One, two. Not sure what this would be useful for, but there you go. Uh, set scale register is three, two. Uh, LDS, S register, SSA have done, LDP is one, two, that's no, not. Ah, right, wrong one. Also, that's EXU, not EXE. Uh, tin resume from right this is this returns from an interrupt it loads all the registers from a uh, memory block this is 72 IO is the all-purpose IO register Actually, what it does, it depends on the value at noun. It is 1, 6. Uh, the, this architecture, it's got standard programmed I.O. that is reading and writing from ports. But it also basically says that you'll hardly ever use this. There's another form of I.O. which it calls cycle stealing which these days would call DMA, where the I.O. unit actually writes directly to memory. And it wants you to use that instead. And that's the end. OK. So uh, it's in the top two digits. OO means it's a simple instruction. We haven't seen an O2. Yes, we have. It's here. Let's do that properly. 246. I haven't seen an 08. Of course, I haven't. It's octal. 246, 10, 12, 14, 16, 20, 22, uh, 20, ILT. 2, 6. Okay, that's correct. I haven't seen a 2, 4. 3, 0, 3, 2, 3, 4, 3, 6. 4, 0, 4, 2, 4, 4. IET is a 4, 6. 5, 0, 5, 4, 5, 6. No, 5, 2. 6, 0, 2, 4. I bet IGT is 6, 6. 707274, what does LDE supposed to be? That was at the top. LDE is 52. So that goes here. Uh, that goes, got that wrong again. ILT, IET is 4, 6. So that's in the right place. 2, 4, 6, 2, 4, 6, 2, 4. 2, 4, 6, 2, 4, 6. Oh, two, there's no 2, 4. Let's have a quick skim. Three six one four seven oh five zero three zero 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 six four 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 oh four. Zero. Not seen a two four. Two four two six two. Two two. 
Yep, no two four. That would be interesting to know what that actually did. Uh, and we also need one more. Which is our DL. Okay. Right, we haven't done op noun. So let's do this one first. Uh, we've read the token. We now want to read the expression. We now want to expect a close square bracket. Set the addressing mode to be a m in. That should be simple enough. Okay, op now and CV implement simple callback. Uh, right, if the addressing mode is am end, then we want to set the uh, the indirection bit in the address, which is thirteenth bit, which is uh, which is that. And the token value, yeah, we want to then write out the opcode ord with the token value, that is token number. Okay, and our token number is a uint sixteen, which is right. And we haven't done op dlcb. We can steal that from here. LCB, we keep reading expressions. Ah. This assembler assumes 16 bit values. So the result of an expression is actually going to be too big to fit. Right, this is actually going to require more refactoring. So let's just avoid that for now. Okay, duplicate symbol during init your oh blast. Right now, this is because the uh, the framework actually defines. its own, hang on, does it? See, I thought this was because the framework actually defines its own symbols for, called things like Eeyore, but it's been a while since I've touched this code. I'm not sure that's true. So where is it setting the default symbol table. I look for dbcb. Uh, uh, 
is a bit missing. Stood Sims, right. Yeah, here we go. These are the standard symbols that are always defined and this is conflicting with the symbol defined by the architecture. Now I think this came up with the 603 Ah, oh, no, it didn't. What about one of the other architectures? Right, the A280 doesn't use the framework, it in fact defines all the symbols itself. Uh, this actually has a complete implementation of the assembler in it, I just haven't got around to refactoring this out to use the framework. Um, what else is there? The PDP 11. This uses the framework. Initialize symbol table. So I believe the PDP 11 one doesn't use the standard symbols. No, it doesn't. Ah, yeah, yeah. It's this include line here that does it. Yeah, I'm an idiot. Okay, we can easily work around this by simply taking the standard symbols and cut and pasting them into our architecture file like this. This will also allow us to do things like remove db. We want our own ds. Uh, we're going to keep dw for the time being. Um, and we can change this to xor. Right. And does it work? Duplicate symbol during the... Uh, okay. Uh, the symbol lookup is not context sensitive, so uh, these are operators. Um, so I'm either going to have to rename this or rename the instruction. I'm going to rename the instructions. Uh, and D and or D for and and or decision bit. Uh, and your is a your a don't like doing that. Okay, now what's it complaining about? Error at line one syntax error. Okay, it's trying to read a expression
No, it's not. I don't think it's getting that far. It's at least getting to here. Yes, it is. Ha! Uh, okay. So what's going on there is that it's hit this expect line and is saying, I thought you were supposed to be at the end of the line, but you're not. You're, in fact... Uh, the the Lexa is sitting there because I completely forgot to read the actual parameter. So let me remind myself how that works. Expect operand. Right, line two syntax error. Um, I am going to guess that this is something to do with the square brackets. And I, yep, this is token uh, open. I don't know what the tokens are called. Uh, so, are things like square brackets, right, everything else is single character token, yeah, um, the, that is this, so, Right, what's happened here is that read expression actually returns the terminating token. So what we want to do is if token is not equal to this, then uh, let's just see how the framework's doing it. Expect expression. Right. So if read expression is not a closing square bracket, then terminated indexed now. And it still doesn't work. Why doesn't it not? Why doesn't it work? Okay, it hasn't actually, it hasn't got that far. Okay, that's because I actually need because the read expression here returns the next token which we're consuming, we actually need to call read token again because read operand is supposed to return the terminating token. So it doesn't work. Okay, it's it's correctly read the 
Right, we don't want that because I expect operand has done it for us. Right, line six, undefined instruction. Yeah, put these back to Ws. I need to refactor. Yep, I need to refactor the framework again to allow the use of 32-bit words. I mean, it's easily done. I just need to replace some things with type defs, but it's annoying. Uh, This is just going to do emit 24 word as you in 32. Okay, and it worked. What has it done? Let's write out a listing file. And this is what we get. Right, now this is in hex and it's little endian. So. Uh, we have 18 bit words. That does not look right. Okay, let's find LDX. Here we go, LDX. In, Oct in Octal is 5 4. So. Let me, what's a good way to convert from octal to hex? No, you can't do that in Lua. You can't do that in Lua. You can't do that in Julia. That works. Okay, so what we're expecting is Five, four, one, two, three, four is a value that looks like uh, OO, CO, O2. So OO, CO, OC. That's actually correct. Uh, That seems so okay. OC is the address of the uh, of value A, which is this OC. In fact, the addresses are all wrong because each instruction is a single uh, word, the program counter actually only goes up by one each time. So we'll have to fix that in a moment. So OC is actually correct for the address. CO is correct for the, um, the next byte of the instruction. This is CO these two digits here. Uh, however, we'd expect the high byte to be 02, and it's not. So, I reckon that symbol here is defined by the framework to be an int 16. Is symbol defined. Here it is. Value U in sixteen. Okay, we're gonna have to start fixing this to a certain extent. That's the simplest way to do it. 
the problem is that I'm going to have to start refactoring a few things. Kawasm. So the framework file is the first thing that gets loaded. Uh, no, it's not. The framework is loaded second. Good, that's easier. So what we can do, yeah. So this include cowasm.co actually defines the framework. So we can simply do a word. Uh, To be you in 32 that would define a type type def even I've forgotten how my own language works is okay uh, and we can go into here and simply change this to word and lots of things fail because we actually need to change a lot of these things to words. are also words four um, token number is a word in fact I can probably just look for you in sixteens that one and that one that one that one and that one and three print hex 16 current value as uint 16 this will produce the wrong value in both cases if if it's a uh, if the value of word is bigger than 16 bits but let's just go with that for now uh, as you went 16 8 as you went 16 okay Right, word is a partial type. This is actually compiling one of the other assemblers because we do need to tell these that word is a uint 16. Arch 603. So let's go as an arch GP11. And it uh, compiles. That was suspiciously easy. So what does this do now? That's better. OK. So that looks like the right instruction. Right. Now let's fix the... Uh, the omit stuff.
So let's actually hang on a second, hang on a second. Now I've just refactored uh, so that the framework knows what a word is. I can just change DW in the framework. So token number is now a word. That fails because I've changed the name of emit 16. So this is now emit word. Uh, this is now emit word. This is emit word. And this is emit word. Okay, why, what is looking for emit 16 in the framework these days? Oh yeah, I know what's happened. Uh, this is now an emit word. And emit, these emit 24s also become emit words because words are the only things we can emit. Arch PDP eleven emit Okay, that works. But we still need to fix our program counter stuff. So, emit 8 is, it emits a byte and increments the program counter. So, what we need to do is find the definition of emit 8, which is nominally complicated. And what this does is it, it deals with multiple pass stuff, but the core bit is this. So all we're going to do is to hack it. Uh, so we emit three bytes, the program counter gets emitted by three, then we adjust correspondingly. And what does this do? That's better. So value A is at address 4. Table is at address 7. Value B is at address 5. And result is at address 6. Good. And let's just stick a halt in for good measure. And that looks correct. So I believe we have a working assembler. So let's commit this. And let's start work on the simulator. So I am going to take a short break to refill my tea and do the boilerplate setup. Be back in one second. All right, here we are. So I've set up some boilerplate and the build tools so that when we do a build, it does actually produce a binary, which is called OAO3 emu, which is rather harder to type than you might think, which is currently 
as empty as a C binary gets. Now I'm going to copy a lot of the framework from the CPM emulator. So let's just cut and paste all this into here. Uh, there's no command line. Fatal is helpful. OAO3 emu entity bugger on startup. Uh, there are no arguments, which is helpful. The only thing you can do is load a binary. Uh, option parsing. Uh, enter debugger. Nothing there. The command line is. Uh, So, uh, binary file name is that. So, if this is null or opt in plus one is not null, then syntax error. So here we want to pass the options, initial, initialize the emulator, and then just keep stepping the emulator. Okay, and that won't build because I haven't included std bool.h. That's better. Okay, this should be a just uh, uh, hang on, I'm doing that wrong. It should be like that. Okay, and I haven't done the emulator tools yet. So, h x to avoid emulator in it. x to avoid emulator run. Okay, so we now go to the emulator file and I will just steal these and we can get started. Okay, this is the bit, this is the interesting bit. This is where we actually get to start playing with the architecture of this thing. So, 18 bit words and four. Uh, four killer words of memory, I believe. So, uh, trying to find the actual, the overall machine description that tells me how big things are. Um, blast. It does not actually say. Well, okay, we're going to assume uh, f a full 18 bit word address space. So, um, actually, I will do const static const int memory size is this number of words. Therefore, this is going to be our memory. Uh, UNT32s, even though we're storing 18-bit ints, it's just easier that way. Okay, emulator init does nothing. Emulator run. that we need to declare fatal okay 
too much cowgirl. Variably modif... Oh. I do have to do or have to find. Okay. So we now have a binary, an emulator with stuff in it. It, uh, it doesn't work because we haven't actually loaded a image yet, which we need to do here. Um, Just thinking, do I need to pass in a parameter for the address at which it gets loaded? I think we're going to assume they all get loaded at zero. So, okay. File FB is F open B. If Get a store error from there, no, don't you? No, string dot h. Okay. Now we wrote this out in the assembler as a three byte words, so we're going to need to read it in as three byte words. So. So read in a byte as a UN32. Okay, so our test file is this that we just loaded in. These numbers don't look like the don't look like the numbers I saw in the hex dump. That's better, that looks more like it. So we should be able to do away03 emu test.image and it then loaded it and then failed at this point. Good, that is actually what we want. Now, at this point we could actually start doing the the machine state, but I'm not going to because I am going to go over here to 
the CPM emulator and I'm going to steal nearly all of this because it's a debugger and I'm going to use the debugger uh, in this code. Some of it's going to need to be modified because, you know, the, the OEO3 doesn't have uh, BDOS, etc. And a lot of these reads and writes will need to be different. This is all set up to actually... Uh, actually, we don't need any of that. This is all set up for uh, libz80ex, that emulator. But it should be easy to modify. Oh yeah, I'd forgotten there needs to be a disassembler. And help debug. And here. This stuff in emulator in it needs to be well, some of this needs to be moved into here. Um, flag enter debugger. Yes, we do want this. Flag enter debugger is actually set here. So it's a bool, we need to put that in here. Flag enter debugger. Yeah, of course that doesn't build. And just for the time being, Let's just comment out nearly all of this. Okay, this goes away. Uh, and this is going to be the actual main loop of our simulator. So show regs, we don't have any registers yet, obviously. not like the the register state of this machine is complicated. Oh, and read line. See how I built that into the ICL read line. Okay, right, that builds. So if we run this with minus D to enter the debugger, it instantly hangs. Oh yeah. So what we want to do here is Let's start defining some state. Okay. So this thing has a very limited number of registers, which is nice for us. So, a register. Uh, I'm 
just going to call out the e register. Storage limit is uh, a very simple simple memory protection, which we're going to have to implement. The subscript register that's for doing indexing into tables. Right, the scale register. So that's SC. Uh, the page register, and then these are bits, carry, decision, or and, overflow. So we want to print these, put that there for reference. So the, the way this, the Z80 state is displayed is that the, uh, the flags are first, so we'll copy that. There's four flags. Uh, oh, I completely forgot the most important one of, of them all, the program counter. Okay, so A equals, you see, I like hex, but this architecture likes octal. Uh, Let's do hex. The problem is that 18 bits doesn't fit into uh, hex very well. Let's use octal. I don't like octal, but so e equals o six. O uh, SL is O six O SS is O six O So who carry uh, yeah, let's go for or and and overflow. Just so that these are all one character, it makes life easier. C D A V C D A V followed by reg A, reg E, reg S L, and reg S S. Followed by just how much space do we have? Six, twelve, twenty-four. Yeah, we can put the other two registers here. So the scale is six digits, which is two. Scale is, yes, that's two binary, uh, two, two octal digits. And page is also two. Okay, now we haven't printed the program counter because that's supposed to go here in the disassembly stage. But I'm just going to ignore that for the time being and just do uh, one, two, three, four, five. Just do that.
Ah, blast. F for flags. And we do need to include readline.h. Okay. Right, now down to the main loop. Address, of course, is 32 bits. What's value? Oh, value is for watch points. So that also needs to be a win 32. So if, if the program counter is on a breakpoint, then break. Check the value of all the watch points. O has changed from six O to six O and stop. Uh, if single stepping into the debugger, if tracing display the registers, otherwise we're actually going to simulate an instruction. Okay, so what time is that? Right, this drops us into our debugger. Uh, four flags are unset. All our registers are set to zero. That all looks fine. And in fact, let's just squeeze the program counter in. There's loads of space. It's nice to have the entire machine state on one line. There you go. Program counter is 166. Why is that 166? It hasn't been initialized to anything. Is that supposed to be there? That's better. All right. So we're now in our debugger. We want to, I mean, the, the first instruct, the first debugger instruction we want to implement is memory, which should be straightforward. That's this one. I uh, you give it two parameters and it dumps the memory between those. Of course, we want our parameters to be in octal. We want them to be rounded to eight bit. No, uh, uh, how many octal words? we want to display. Can we get eight in? I think we... So that's nine by six, which is 54 out of 80. Yes, we can. So we want to display eight octal words per line. Okay. Display the address. that. Um, this ASCII dumper is also, this dumper, hex dumper, is also supposed to display the ASCII representation, but uh, this machine would never have used ASCII. So I think we're just going to ignore that. Okay, so we should now have our memory dumper. 
All right, dump from zero to 20. Not quite what I wanted. Okay, let's try that. 20, okay. Now, let me just look at that listing. So, these don't look anything like these. So these values are clearly these ones, 240, oh, but these, see this one shows a little bit. Right, what's happened is I've completely screwed up my loader. This is why I wanted to do the memory thing. Uh, I think I need to do this to make sure that sign extension doesn't happen. No, that wasn't it. So what do we have here? 05CO02. 05CO02. 081001 yeah okay the the memory dump in the listing does actually match what's in the file but these are kind of garbage So we are actually getting incorrect data. But why? The precedence of the shift are weird so that wasn't it just checking that to be sure ah ah I'm thinking in hex so if you shift by two digits in hex that's eight bits if you shift by two digits in octal that's six bits I mean, it's still wrong. Yes, um, that's because I'm completely mangling my octal, my hex. This is a hex dump. This is an octal dump. Uh, it would have actually been better if this were an octal dump. But that would be annoying to implement, so I won't do it. Um, I really want to compare... Yeah, let's just go for, let's dump that in hex. Idiot, idiot. 
it says shouldn't be doing this quite so late okay well, so what how does that look o5 c0 o2 yep o8 one zero o one yup o six four zero o okay right we are now loading the binary correctly finally uh so let's just get rid of that bit of tracing run it again m zero to twenty and this is the actual octal instruction set and you see these actually look like well uh 5.4 was LDX, which is here, plus the address, which is 5, which is this. Yep, yeah. that is fine. We've now correctly loaded the binary, and we are dumping memory. The breakpoint stuff should just work with minor tweaks. I just need to change these. This is uh, listing the breakpoints. This is setting a breakpoint. Watch points. This is a unit 32. Too many watch points. Six O current value is six O. Delete a breakpoint by address. Oh yeah, I need to update these to octal. Uh, delete a watch point like that. Okay, so now we should have fully functioning breakpoints. Let's set a breakpoint at address three. List it back. There is a breakpoint at three. Set a watch point at four. List it back. Uh, zero, one, two, three, four. Current value is indeed zero. Let's set a watch point at three. Uh, yep, that's correct. Okay, so I think breakpoints and watch points should work. Uh, oh yeah, we don't need the BDOS stuff. Tracing should should work. Um, well, that's just going to be zero or one, so it doesn't really matter what that is. Disassembler, do really want one. Those are better to do the disassembler. So this is actually going to be. This wants to call uh, ZATX DASM to actually do the disassembly because this is based on a. Of course, this is the Z80 debugger. But let's change that to very simple. Disassemble into the buffer. Uh, at address, all instructions the same length, so we don't need to care about len. Uh, 
Uh, in show regs here, we actually want to states we want to disassemble the current instruction in order to be able to print it okay so now the disassembler proper doing buffer size D buffer size and the address okay well This masks off the uh, the top four bits of the opcode. Four bits, five bits, four bits, five bits. These five bits. Uh, seven, six. Yes, that's correct. No. Yes. <laughs> yes, okay, the top six bits of the opcode. If the five bits even. Uh if it's zero, then it's going to be one of the simple instructions. Otherwise, it's going to be one of these instructions here. So go to our uh, assembler, and we're just going to copy this table. To here. Now I'm trying to remember my vim column operations. Will this work? Yes, it does. Good. And of course, C doesn't do that syntax for octal. Instead, it uses the thoroughly confusing and dangerous zero prefix. We do also want the default for unencodable instructions. other ones, these ones.
this is going to look pretty similar, but of course these all take a parameter. And we don't want to return after these, but we do want to break. And of course, there's the default case. Okay. So if once we get down the bottom, we've printed the uh, the opcode, we now need the argument. So first we want to check for indirectness, which is going to be insen and uh, see these they start bits at one rather than zero, which is really annoying. So that's twelve. If this bit is set, then you see, now I'm trying to remember how to concatenate using SN printf. It's doing strings in C is a really annoying. Uh, is there a Is there a libbsd function that does it? I don't think there is. What's d printf? GNU extensions that were standardized. Uh, uh, will the, these will allocate memory. Uh, can we do this more cleverly? Yes, we can. So rather than actually call printf there, we're just going to set the format string. So this is then going to become buffer, buffer size, format, So if we're indirect, that wants to be a open square bracket. Then we want the instruction. We want the four bottom 
uh, digits of the instruction, that's these t uh, 12 bits, followed by the close square bracket, and I believe that's all there is. What's this complaining about? Wrong octal syntax. Okay, and this is correctly disassembled the instruction at uh, address zero. So let's go ahead and do the, oh, we've done unassemble. So I should just be able to say zero, naught, 20. Uh, these need to be eight, zero, naught, 20. And we disassemble our program. Does our disassembly match what we see here? Uh, LDX5. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, LDA10. Of course, this is hex and this is octal. Add six is this one store in seven okay we have our disassembler right now the reason why i wanted to do that is because the decode for the disassembler is exactly the same as the decode for the simulator so now we can start work on that bit and what we're going to do is simply copy this. Um, actually, we're going to put this in a different function. reasons that will become apparent later. All right. So first thing we need to do is to remove all this stuff and replace it with this here as well. So, okay, in fact, we can be slightly clever about that. I wish I thought about this before I did it. We have to sub subtract one from the program counter there because we've added one here. Right. 
Good. Uh, we are, by the way, starting execution in the wrong place. It shouldn't be at zero. It should be starting from the the execution starting interrupt, but we'll ignore that for now. Right, so our LDX was 5.4, wasn't it? I think I scrolled past it. 5.4 LDX. So this is, here we go. Right, the contents of the storage at the effective address is placed in the subscript register. Registers altered subscript register. So we're going to be doing a lot of fetching effective addresses. So we're going to do a function for that, which returns an address. Now it's going to be an instruction. So We want the bottom four digits if the indirection bit is set not the indirection bit, I'm thinking of a different architecture, this is the subscript bit. So noun, we add on the uh, subscript register and that becomes our effective address. So 5.4 is very simply not that, not that, it's, uh, we are then dereferencing that. And we're going to define a couple of functions for doing this because particularly when it comes to writing we actually want to do some extra work. Reg, ah, it's not called X, it's called S, S. Wait a minute. Yeah, we're going to call it X because that makes sense and SS doesn't. Because like the, the the instructions, their instructions call it X. Okay, so we run that. So we should be able to step once. And we have in fact loaded the value of two into the X register. That's good. So the next instruction is going to be LDA. Which is the same thing, but for the accumulator. So naively, we would expect this to be like a equals read ea inson break. However, we have uh, some of these other bits. Now, when do these get set? So, uh, 
carry, stores the carry out of bit 17 of the parallel adder. So this is only used on add instructions. Uh, the other interesting one is overflow, which won't happen on an LDA. Oh, and of course, there is no parity instruction, a uh, parity bit. Parity is calculated by an instruction. Oh, that's nice. This means that I don't have to update any of these bits based on the result of ordinary operations. Only special operations have to do this. Also, I've completely forgotten about the page bit. So, uh, the page flag, rather. So this is actually going to be reg p shifted left by 12 ord with the address. Okay, so this should work. And this is also going to test the indirection. So load x with 2. Now we try to load a and we get 6. Is 6 the right value? Yes it is. Table plus 2 is 10. 10 decimal and that stores the value 6. And then the add will fail. Okay, that's good. So let's go through and uh, implement some of the other simpler ones. So 40 is LDL. So this is actually Actually, I'm doing that the wrong way around. We don't want to do that. We don't want to add on reg p here. Reg p is actually should be calculated by the effective address calculator. So all this does is deal with a real address. That simplifies life here. I can just do that. Right, STA is six zero. So we're going to write uh, reg a to the effective address. Now write is interesting. Because there's protected storage. Now, how does protected storage work? Uh, this is the S. L S L register. Storage limit controls where writing into memory is permitted. Be nice if there was more information about that. Okay, let's take a look at the instructions. Control of st no no storage limit registers page sixty three. Okay, it's an 8-bit storage limit register which is used to enable blocks of memory into which writing is enabled because in flight you don't want to accidentally overwrite your attitude control code because that would be bad. The register is broken into two 9-bit fields, A and B, where A is B b1 to b9 and b is b10 to b18 
Oh, these bees are bits. That could be. That could be clearer, but they are going to the going to a nice effort to actually define absolutely everything. I have to say, this document is a joy to work with. It is so concise and clear. And some of the concepts have got odd names because it was 1968, but. A and B represent upper and lower limits on the nine high order bits of a 16 bit effective address between which writing will be permitted. If C is B8 to B16 of the effective address, ah, yes. Uh, I've given it too much memory. You can't. I think there's only 16 address bits. Uh, the effective operand address for one of the four instructions above. Then if. Yeah. Right will not be permitted. If A equals B, then 128 word block is enabled. OK. Right, now, do you need to rename the register? What do the instructions call it? Set scale, set page. Uh, one thing this could do is do with is a concise table of all the opcodes. But they're clearly pushing the English language syntax so much that I don't think it would fit. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, there must be an instruction that does it. Comparisons and a call return jump step subscript save subscript flip cycle shift complement your Interesting. Uh, is it actually documented? Storage limit. Uh, content, yeah. I have a horrible feeling it's not defined here. Unless you, there isn't an instruction to set it, and you have to use the interrupt code, which will save the storage limit, that's quite plausible. So on startup, the state of all the registers, including the store at limit register, will be read from the startup interrupt block. 
So maybe that's where it's come from, and there is no way to change it on the fly other than to update one of the interrupt blocks. Yeah, I think that's quite likely. Okay, well, we're going to set it on startup for now. So the storage limit needs to be uh, so A wants to be all ones and B wants to be all zeros. A is for is the rightmost. They are two. Okay, so that's three six nine. Okay, so A is this field which is all ones. B is this field which is all zeros. Right. So now we need to implement our. I need to implement this. So. A is going to be and B is going to be uh, now these represent the nine high order bits of a 16 bit effective address so we actually want to shift left by shift this left by and this right by is that correct? B8 to B16 Uh, that's oh, that's inclusive. That's nine bits with their odd numbering. So three, six, nine, right shift by four. So the B ends up aligned high. Okay, so address a if b is less than equal to c and c is less than or equal to a then perform the right done add yet okay so we're not actually going to get that far let's do add uh, add is of course this means that you can only write to the bottom 64k words of memory but I think that is fine uh, it doesn't give the overall specs of the machine You get 12 bits of address available, 
yeah here we go memory size as large as 64 64 uh, k words requires a 4-bit page register to be loaded and stored in program control so it's added to the 12-bit address here to form a 16-bit address okay so the memory size is actually going to be one shift to the left 16 and this also means that our read and our write need to be uh, if address is greater or equal than memory size Actually, I believe the system is likely to just ignore the extra bits. So let's just do this instead. All right. So where's that add instruction? Here we go. O4. So this is actually a little trickier than it looks because we need to set the carry bit. So um, let's just put that in a helper function like so. So the simple thing to do is simply to do uh, I'm laying it out like this because we're actually going to use the same code for ADX. So the obvious thing is to just do that. However, that doesn't set the uh, the overflow bit. Now the overflow, well, carry and overflow. When does overflow happen? Is that multiplication divide? Yes, overflow register continually. Oh, overflow does happen with add. If uh, carry occurs, uh, that's nice. This machine can distinguish between carry and overflow, which is really interesting. All right, so now how do we actually compute this? Uh, this is actually a known trick with emulators and I am gonna go look it up. Okay, I'll admit that the difference between carry and overflow does make my head hurt, but I think I've got a reasonable handle of how it works. Let's define a few things. So this is going to be the largest signed word we can represent, which is 17 bits. So that is uh, 3, 6, 9, yeah, okay. And just this, that's the, this is going to be the smallest value we can represent. This is negative value. 
So that is going to be uh, which is going to be that. Now it helps no end on this architecture in that we can represent we can actually do the arithmetic in 32 bits so we don't have to so we can detect carry and overflow after we've done the addition rather than before. There is actually another thing I need to do, which is this. This is going to sign extend a word. Uh, so the way we're going to do this is we're going to shift our word left uh, until it until the sign bit of the word aligns with the sign bit of a 32-bit integer. So you want to shift it left 32 minus 18 bits. And then we're going to cast it to a signed value. And shift it back again. resulting in uh, resulting in a appropriately signed number and I'm actually going to put that as a helper function here just to make the code easier of our addition is the signed interpretation of value. The right hand is the signed interpretation of what's at that effective address. We compute the result. And we are going to return the result masked down to the appropriate size. Right, what are we going to do about the sign and overflow bits? Well, they both start out as zero, so like so. If the result is less than the minimum value we can represent, or the result is greater than the largest version we can represent, then we set the overflow bit. We can do that with this, actually. Now, the carry flag uh, this will get set whenever the whenever a carry ripples off the left hand side of the value, which will happen, I believe, during every overflow, but also when the value passes zero. So that if you start with two and you subtract four, it doesn't overflow, but you do get a carry propagation. So, uh, how do we do this? Because uh, it's not sufficient just to say, has the left hand side changed sign? Because if the left hand side is minus f two and you add four that will cause that will change the sign 
if I'm just wondering if it's symmetrical. So my initial example was 2 minus 4, well 2 plus minus 4. Let's try that the other way around. So we've got minus 4 plus 2. That will produce the same result but won't carry. Okay, let's go with the left hand side changing sign. I believe that's right. Let me write this down. So, 2 plus minus 4, carry gets set. Minus 4 plus 2. Harry does not get set. That seems plausible. Yeah, let's go with that. I'll have to check up on all this later. It'd be nice if there was a test suite. I mean, there probably is a NASA somewhere, but I don't have it. In fact, I think it's. I think there's a reference in the documentation to it. Ah. Uh, Is it somewhere under Diagnostics 54? Diagnostics. A set of CPU diagnostics exists which is aimed at testing the execution of all machine instructions. Yeah, I would love to get my hands on that. Okay, but we're going to have to do this the hard way. Okay, the sign bit is in bit 17 by my numbering. So if value and 117 is not equal, sorry, if left 117 is not equal to result and 117. And I can do better than that. I can do... like so. Okay, and uh, the overflow bit is actually called FV. All right, let's see what this does. So load x with value of 5, load with that. So uh, we are now going to be adding on the value at 6, which is 4. So 6 plus 4 should equal decimal 10. Uh, Let me double check that. A is 6. The actual value 6. We're adding on the value at 6, which is this, which is 4. So 6 plus 4 is decimal 10 or octal 1, 2. Does not look right. Anyway, let's try the store. Store into 7. Here's our A, B, and C for the bounds checking. It looks like it's in bounds, but let's actually look to see whether it did it. Uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It should have gone there, and it hasn't. OK. So if B is less than address, true, and address is less than A, true, assign. Uh, 
And address is... Oh, ad address is 1, 1. Sorry, I'm looking in the wrong place. Yeah, this is the value here. It's been put in the in the wrong place. Uh, this is 1, 1. Yeah. STA7. I know what it's done. I know what it's done. It's read what's at 7 and is using the contents of that. Yeah, the content of the accumulator is stored at the effective address, not at the address stored at the effective address. So STA That is what I wrote. So that's interesting. So what's EA going to do when given with a 7? Well, this bit's not set. It's going to OR in reg P, but P is 0. So it's going to return 7. So why are we getting... Eleven for address. Mm. Okay, we're going to need to use the debugger. Okay. Step, 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 step. Uh, the address does look wrong. Instruction is right. It's going to work. Yes, it is going to work. Well, that's wrong. Okay, so let's try that again. Step, step, step. Right. Break EA. Continue. Step. Yes, I am using a debugger to debug a debugger. One. So noun is seven. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's this is wrong. Uh, this these should be like that. That's probably what was affecting the ad as well. There, there we go. Uh, A is now 1, 2, which is correct. Store at address 7. Let's look and see what that is. Address 7 is this, which is 1, 2, which is the right number. We've just correctly simulated our first program. Good. Right, let's add some more instructions. Uh, just going to go from the top. So, LDA, LDL, STA LDE is five two it's this one reg E equals B A A Inson. Nothing complicated there. STE is one zero Uh, add 
method we've done okay multiply and divide I'm going to ignore for now ADC plus carry is this one okay so this adds on the uh, the value of the carry flag to uh, the A register. I'm going to change my mind about this. You left and you right. So this now just does the arithmetic. So this is going to be, I'm going to need to put a read there, because this will then allow us to use the, we want to add reg A to reg FC, done. Neg negated is Uh, negating all zeros yields a value zero. Yields that's the carry register to one. Right, so this is actually subtracting from zero. I didn't spot a sub. There may not be one. Well, this is the one that we decided was four. Okay, so. Okay, this is actually special. It's not doing a conventional sub subtract, so we can special case all the all the things. So, negating all zeros yields a result of zero and set the carry register to one. but doesn't touch the overflow. Negating all zeros use a result of zero. Negating the number that has zeros in all bit positions except the sign. Which is going to be this. Uh, yields the same number as a result and sets both the carry register and the overflow register to 1. Otherwise, the carry register is reset to 0. and the overflow register is not touched. All right. Right, and with uh, three zero. This is simple. Yep. A, oh, two. Like so, don't have to care about any flags. Uh, five zero for 
o Seven zero for Eeyore, which of course we renamed. CMP complemented is this one. Shift. All right, now this is a value by Amount Okay, the lower six order bits of the content of storage at the effective address. So uh, we are actually going to need to lower six order bits but now the sign extension is going to have to be different Okay, so that should do it. Actually, we don't need the and anymore. So if the count is negative, shift right, that's easy. No, hang on. If it's shift, if it's positive, it's shifted left with zeros. Otherwise, yeah. Um, I'm looking to see whether it's a uh, a signed or an unsigned shift. It is a signed shift. So if it is, if it's less than zero. Shift right, otherwise shift left. Okay, uh, double shift. This shifts A and E together. So, three, six, noun. D, yes. So this is actually, it's a bit annoying, so we're just going to have to hardwire the register values.
Okay, now. Two 18-bit values. Uh, let me just see which way round it goes. The extended accumulator is to the right of the accumulator. And its sign bit is not shifted. Wow, that's weird. The count is positive, shifted right. If the count is negative, yeah, okay. Right, that's a bit weird. Okay, so to the 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 low order seventeen bits are reg e. The high order are reg a sign extended. like that. So if amount is less than zero, shift value by minus, shift value right by minus amount, else shift value left by amount. So reg E Mask of just so it's just the sign bit left. Then or in like that. Except we're actually wrong here. We want to shift left by thirty one because we're not including the sign bit. Reg A becomes um, the high 18 bits but we also want to set the uh, sign bit that we also set the overflow flag I just realized I forgot to do this for the other shift so we're actually going to do this then So reg A equals new reg A. Okay. Okay, it's, it's easier to do the sign bit here because our new value is just value. So if value and sign bit is not equal to, uh, or you can get the old value from here, new value and sign bit. Return value. Okay, really want that test suite. Cycled by, oh god. So this is rotate, and doing rotate in C is a bind. Uh, so it's essentially the same code. 
and I'm going to do it with hardwired registers because that's actually easier. Now, two's complement shift count. If the content is negative, the content shifted cyclically right, with bits leaving the low order position entering the sign position. Yeah. If the count is positive, right, this is unsigned. That makes life so much easier. Well, there's no such thing as a signed rotate. Okay. So if the amount is less than zero, we are shifting right. Yep. So reg A becomes reg A shifted right by minus amount, awed with reg A shifted left by Thirty-two minus amount, I believe. So okay, we're shifting right by one. So amount is minus one. So reg A shift right by one. Now the the bottom bit now needs to go to the top. So we actually want to shift left by seventeen. So given that amount is minus one that should do it in that direction. So in the other direction, we're shifting left by one, so we want to shift the top bit down to the bottom, so that is 18 minus amount. I believe. And no flag set. Good. Double cycle. Uh, it's counted negative. The content of the accumulator extended accumulator should cyclically write. Giving the low order, blah, blah, blah. Accumulator entering the sign of the extended accumulator. Okay, so this is, is shifting the, the extended accumulator sh sign bit. Right, that looks straightforward. We can do it like this. So, uh, the extended accumulator goes in the low bit. Reg A goes in the high bit. Oh yeah, and we also want to, to make sure it's unsigned. So we are shifting, uh, that's actually 64, did I get that right for double shift, 64, yep, so thirty six plus amount and thirty six minus amount value value so reg a becomes the high bit reg e becomes the low bit Right, and I actually want to test this one. So let's go to our assembly file. So, uh, how do we 
going to do this. A is the high, so that's going to be 1. Value E is going to be the low, which is going to be 0. So uh, LDA value A, LDE value E. And we want to shift right by one, so that's minus one. Uh, hopefully this will work. Double shift by amount, and just leave it at that. So let's assemble it. Check it looks plausible. It does, and run the simulator. Okay, A is 1, E is 0. We're going to shift right by 1, so we expect this 1 to show up here. Uh, 5, 6. I forgot to put the instruction in. To decide read EA ensign. Let's try that again. Yes, that worked. Our one moved from here to here. Uh, let's. Now we want to shift in the other direction. It turns out we have a 1 in value A. This is where constant pools are handy. So shift right, shift left. Didn't work. That'll be why. And I'm actually going to rename some of these to be the uh, opcode name just for clarity. And it's back the way it was. A is 1 and E is 0. Good, that bit works. Okay, what have we got next? Normalize. Okay, this is actually fairly straightforward. We just keep shifting left. Uh, the sign bit is extended accumulator. It's not shifted. It's one of those. We keep shifting left. And the, the scale register gets changed. We start, to, yeah, we set the scale register to zero. And if the content of the accumulator in positions one through 17 of the extended accumulator is zero, then the scale register is set to zero. Okay. That's not bad. That is this one. So we want to uh, assemble a value. from well, this uh, we don't want it to be but well, we don't care about it being sign extended because we're shifting left which is easy
Also, my dush here is wrong. This wants to be a 17, not a 31. Uh, we want to reset reg sc to zero. So while uh, now the So the 17th and 18 bits of the accumulator. These are the top two bits of the accumulator. Uh, the top two bits of our combined value, which is 18 plus 17 bits wide, which is 35. So we want to check to see whether bits 35 and 34 are different, i.e. 01 or one zero. Let's do this the slow but sensible way. Yeah, not exactly rocket science, well actually is, it is, is rocket science. Given that one of these is in the Hubble Space Telescope. Right, uh, so now we've done this we want to break down, we want to copy value into reg A and reg E again, so that's basically this code. Like that. Lefchis count is greater than or equal to the width of the type, but the type is an int64. Okay. LDD, close extension with decision. Content of the accumulator, extended accumulator is shifted left. The sign of the extended accumulator is not shifted, and the vacated low order position of the extended accumulator is filled with the content of the decision register. Not sure what this one's for. I know what this one's for. It's for long division. This is an operation that you do a lot in long divisions. Um, I'm going to guess that, that div instruction, here we go, uh, no this does in fact, this is a two word divide. To the right, the content of the sign fills positions vacated on the left, so the overflow is impossible. Yeah, I to really need that uh, test suite. So this is a two-word divide, but I... So why would they be doing long divisions as well? Hmm. Okay. So we assemble our value, shift it left by one, 
or in the decision bit. And put things back the way they were. Flip. Twenty two. Uh, I have a vague memory there's a standard function for doing this. order of bytes but I don't see anything about bits okay well it's easy enough to implement um, it doesn't change set any bits so we can do it the simple way so clear reg 0 uh, Copy the sign bit to reg A. Is that right? So we start with a one in value so that we're going to or in first 17 zeros shifting right each time okay on the 18th cycle through our one's been promoted to the sign bit and therefore it gets copied into reg a, but I don't think we want to do the shift uh, after let's test that one Okay, yep, yeah, that does it. See, our one has moved all the way to the left. That doesn't mean it's like guaranteed to work, but it's at least sanity checked it. Okay, LDX, I think we've done that one. We have STX74. ADX is add, does not change anything other than the subscript register. So, okay, O2. So it doesn't change, it doesn't set any of the other carry or overflow. So that's actually straightforward. We can just do. this. Okay, one of these. 
yeah, it's getting quite late and I'm clearly not going to finish this in one session. So I think I am going to call it a day for now. I mean, I'm going to splice these together. Uh, but I'll also take up the opportunity of the break in order to do some hunting around for that test suite because this is so badly going to need one. I may have to do a Calgol port to the architecture just so I can verify that the emulator works reasonably well. All right then. Well, since yesterday I have done a little bit more research and I've discovered two interesting things. One is that this machine is not actually called the OA03. It, that is the name of the spacecraft it was in. This one, the Orbiting Astronomical Observatory Mark III. The name of the computer is in fact the Onboard Processor or OBP. It, not a very uh, imaginative name. I assumed this was a description rather than the name. The other thing I found is documentation for this the Advanced Onboard Processor, or AOP. This is the uh, the next generation of computer after the OBP. And looking at the design, there's a lot of stuff here on the uh, actual assembly. The bit I'm interested in is right at the end, which is the instruction set. It's basically the same machine with a few more opcodes. This is very useful as it uh, fills in some of the blanks. For example, it actually describes here the structure of the interrupt blocks, which we'll need to actually implement interrupts and, you know, start the machine. Uh, it also shows uh, a couple of instructions. So you remember that I had to guess that the negate instruction, neg, had the opcode 04. Well, the AOP has 04, so I think that is correct. Uh, the other one is that it's got a, where is it? This is actually an alphabetical order. Here we go, a subtract instruction at opcode 24. And if I go over here to the assembler, remember I was surprised that there was a gap in the instruction set. Uh, there was no instruction at 2.4. So I am going to guess that there is actually supposed to be a sub-instruction here. It's just uh, the document I was looking at was missing it. So I'm going to put that in and then implement it. So we now have sub and neg in hopefully the right kind of places. It seems very peculiar that there would be no sub-instruction, but there would be a neg, so... Uh, the AOP looks like it's backwards compatible with the OBP. Um, I haven't actually verified that for real yet. They've renamed some of the instructions as well. Uh, like here, for example... Not there. What am I looking for? Test accumulator Z I A Z T E Z uh, Okay. I think this document might not be searchable. Yeah. Uh, these are all ancient, ancient scanned documents, so it depends whether whoever scanned them pushed them through OCR or not. Uh, but the instruction I'm looking for here is uh, test if accumulator is zero. 
which I think and this one is IAZ I think that's a minor op code no I cannot find it well uh, on this one it's uh, on this one it's IEZ on the other one on the AOP it is TAZ um, I also noticed that this uh, document doesn't mention the English language syntax so uh, they obviously reworked the mnemonics but I'm going to stick with the document I currently have for now. Another thing that came up is that I'm really going to have to write a test suite. I couldn't find one. I'm sure the NASA one still exists somewhere on a printout or a tape in the bottom of an office drawer. But I'm actually going to have to do one. And uh, I'm also going to do a few modifications to the syntax now that I understand better how it works. So this was the uh, the test file I was using last time. There's actually nothing at all interesting there. So let's just go to the uh, OTP emu test suite, which is currently empty. So last time I came up with this syntax meaning uh, load A with the variable at noun, store A into the variable at noun. This uses, this is, this reads the effective address, this writes the effective address. Uh, I also came up with this meaning read effective address plus x. Now I don't think they make an awful lot of sense so what I'm going to actually do is change the syntax so this means read or write effective address this is the subscripted form See, now it makes it explicit that we are adding x, that should be a comma, we're adding x onto the address of noun and then dereferencing the result. Uh, there are a few instructions like LDL which just do this, that is they are loading a with the value noun. Uh, this also means that DW is consistent because uh, this will take the value of noun, that is the address, and just emit it directly. And uh, there's, I think, another instruction that takes an effective address. It means there'll be a lot of square brackets, but it should be so much more consistent. Uh, this also allows such things as you can indirect a pointer with load the value of the pointer into x. Uh, this adds x to 0 and dereferences the result. I mean, you could do it with the old syntax as well. It's just it would be it wouldn't make any sense. So Let's go to our assembler. Uh, this also allows immediate, which is going to be important because I'm going to, going to need to add support for that. So, oh yeah, we also need a register symbol, of which there is one, which is x. sub op reg callback implements symbol callback is okay so 
Uh, when it's a square bracket, we read the expression If the terminating token is a comma, then we expect to get, uh, did I write an expect token? Uh, did I write an expect symbol rather? I don't think I did. Uh, I tried trying to remember how I did this. I think 6383 did it. Oh yeah, there's a read register. What did that do? Ah, oh, we already have a reg CB callback. So I don't need to implement this. And this is just reg CB. Okay, so uh, square bracket, then an expression, uh, and then we expect, if there's a comma immediately afterwards, we expect to register. The addressing mode is therefore, uh, let's change that to noun, Uh, now let's change that to address and subscripted. Okay, so the other thing, in fact, there is no immediate, it's just address. Uh, but we are going to want to add it, so, okay. Uh, so this should be am address. Is that going to assemble? Subscripted, okay. So let's build this it's OBC. Output to test image and test list, and what do we have in test list? Um, these look like the same opcode. Oh, yeah, I don't want to make the mistake I did last time. These are hex, not octal. So I think that is working. We're also going to have to um, LDL does not take a index noun, it takes a a drum.
actually the uh, So what I was thinking was that LDL is supposed to take a direct value. Uh, however, the description is that it computes the effective address and return, loads, the addre loads the address of the, well, loads the resulting address into A. So it doesn't dereference it, it just loads it. But it's still computing an effective address, which means you can still use the index form. So we want to use the same syntax. Um, I Oh, also I hadn't noticed this instruction here, load indirect. I am looking at the right document. No, I'm not. I'm looking at the advanced document. which has more instructions in it. And in fact, that was opcode one, two, which is... Okay, they've reassigned the, uh, opcode one, two from uh, execute to load indirect. So that means it's not backwards compatible. That's irritating. Okay, the effective address is placed in the accumulator. Now, I don't believe there are any other instructions that work directly on the effective address. Let me just skim these. They all say the content of storage at the effective address. The content of storage at the effective address. Yes. 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 Content of the subscript register is stored at the effective address. That's just a write, but it's still the content of the effective address. Yes. Okay, the branch instructions are where I stopped last time. The content of the storage at the effective address. Okay. Content. Yeah, BRM. Content. Uh, content of storage. 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 Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, right, so they, they are all in fact the same form, which is nice. Right, so we've updated the assembler. We want to actually start doing a test suite. Now, one of the issues with this architecture is, for example, BRU, which is go to. On a conventional architecture, you'll be able to say BRU label. Uh, something like this. However, this syntax is not allowed by the instruction set. You have to do this. And label here has to be a variable containing the address that we want to jump to, which is really annoying. So what I'm going to do is implement that stuff to do with constant pools so that you can actually write this and also this. 
and what the assembler will do is it will automatically allocate a label but well, allocate a variable containing the address of of the thing that you're referring to and in this case it will allocate an address referring to a 5 so that was actually what i wanted im for but that's not that is actually not needed so the way that's going to work let's call that a value Uh, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. Right, we have effective address, subscripted effective address, or a value. So square brackets mean that you're always dealing with a subscripted effective address or, whoops, I actually forgot to set this, SE mode equals, or an ordinary effective address. Otherwise, it's a value. So this is going to be EA, don't do anything to the opcode, uh, subscripted effective address, Yes, do something with the opcode. And we're going to have to implement val. And what val is going to do is uh, allocate a label into uh, the, en the end of the program, write out a word of data, and then insert the address of the label into the opcode uh, as an EA. Now we actually have some support for this in the framework, in these these segment things. So let me just remind myself how this works. Okay, that does not look complicated. So all we are going to do is here in value, we want to Take the current program counter in the uh, data segment. Advance it only by one. We do actually want to define a label in the new segment. Now that happens with the uh, with the not existing in that table. That would be. Does this work again? So we want to add a symbol. Okay, here's here is the main loop of the assembler. Um, it needs to. Uh, 
set implicit label, I believe. So this is, now this is defining a symbol. We don't want to define a symbol. This is an anonymous label. We just want to omit the word to the data segment. which is going to be change the segment to the we don't want that at all change segment to the data segment we want to omit the token I don't think we want this anymore because token number should now be a word uh, now it's actually even easier than that always use the functionality that's there already switch to the data segment emit the word switch back to the code segment token number is the previous address of the uh, data segment and we're also going to want to do Because we're playing with the current segment, we also want to check for this. Uh, segment text. Okay, now this is actually pretty rough and ready. Too many parameters in call to segment callback. What we should actually do and why are we getting those errors? That's the Z80 code complaining about something we're doing. Our workspace is too big. Why is our workspace too big? Okay, uh, that's a cowgirl bug. We can't call segment CB here. Ah, uh, yeah, right. Segment CB is a symbol callback. You can't call a um, you can't call a routine that implements a interface from another routine which implements the interface. It would be good for the language to actually detect that.
So we're just going to do this, clean things up a bit. So here we can actually just do change segment, segment data, change segment, segment text. Okay, now I was saying this is pretty rough and ready because what we should be doing is keeping track of each constant we're emitting and reusing the values if you emit the same constant again. But we're not doing that for now. So, um, so this should have actually done it. However, it looks like it hasn't. So what should have happened is that it read the immediate value here as a value token via this. And then here it should have done the stuff. However, it does not actually appear to have done anything. So this is uh, the bottom 12 bits are 0, 0, 002 which is this address, which is not the address I wanted. So why hasn't that worked? Right, hasn't that, it hasn't hit this piece of code, that's why. Am I calling the right uh, routine? I think I'm not. I have uh, the build system actually requires a certain number of tool chains to be enabled, which I disabled in order to try and do faster builds, but that seems not to have worked. So we just wait for it to do a that's about half the system build. We still have disabled a lot of tool chains. Shouldn't take long. Anyway, while that's going, let's have a look over here. Uh, let's do a um, ooh. Why did that fail to build? Ran out of registers. Odd. Uh, 
Okay, what's happening here is that I've been a little bit too clever for my own good, trying to make the build faster. There we go, it works. Works now. Right, I was in fact running the wrong, yeah, the wrong binary. It's OB, OBP, not OBC. That's better. So let's take out the print. Ah, <laughs> I took out the thing I was wanting to test. So BRU label. And label is 000, which is the wrong value. Uh, um, I think I've missed a bit. I actually think now I need to... Do I need to tell it where to emit the segments? Did I put the six three three linker? Don't think that's using segments. Yes, I think that should have worked. So uh, that should have... Here's the framework. So in the main routine, we, what uh, is this disassembler is really inefficient. We keep looping until no labels have changed, and then we emit the segments one after the other. Right. I haven't told it that the data segment should go after the text segment. I remember putting in some code to do that, but I also have a bit of a feeling I may have taken it out again. Because it's more useful to have the segments all exist in conceptually the same address space. But in the same numeric range, for stuff like the 8080, where the uh, you have your code segment and your data segment in separate address spaces. So. So this will set the program counter for the current segment. So I should be able to do dseg org oo. I should be able to do that. Can only use immediate values from the code segment. Say. So that has worked, I believe. Let me try and turn this back into that's three two oh oh three two oh 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 in octal. 
Well, you can see that it's emitted two values into the code segment. So we have our 2, which is the address of label, and we have a 5, which is the immediate here. The 5 here, you can see the address is... Uh, it's got a 1 at the end, which means it's the second word, it's red. So it's obviously getting the code segment offset correct, but it has... Oh, blast. Uh, yeah, what's happened is the we've set the base of the code of the data segment after it's emitted the constant. So what we need to do is this. That's better. That has actually worked. So the values here are the addresses of the data in the data segment. However, that's not really what we want. What we want to do is to tell it that we want the data segment to immediately follow the code segment. So, So this means that at the beginning of each pass, rather than initializing, the these addresses to zero, by default we want them to follow one after the other. So uh, how many segments do we have? Text data and BSS. So what we actually want to do is to say BSS follows data data follows text text is zero uh, we do need to make sure that we initialize this to zero and this to zero. Okay, the problem is this is a semantic change for the rest of the system. So this may have broken the MS-DOS compiler. Uh, if now, if you want your segments to start at address zero, you have to explicitly put a org zero in. But we should be able to simply do this. And that looks relatively plausible. I don't see the the values being emitted. That's a four, which is which is after the end of the listing. Well, here's our 5, and here is the 2, which is the address of the label. So the image is correct, it's just the listing that's not working. I bet that if I were to put a dseg here... Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, this is a minor bug in the listing, but we're going to stick with it because this now works. Good. So let's uh, commit this.
Okay, now our test suite. So the first thing we're going to need to do is have the ability to actually write stuff out to the console. And we're going to do that using the all-purpose I.O. instruction. See, there are four different forms. Uh, they all have the same encoding. The only thing that's different is the I.O. channel description, which is the thing pointed to by noun here. Uh, there are four forms. There's DMA, which is this one. They call it cycle stealing here. Um, and cycle stealing. Where's the other one? Um, let function to the content of the storage. Put one to sixteen are a function code. Oh, so this sets up a DMA channel. The content of the accumulator is placed at location seven, which is weird. Content to location 7 is then output to the IU unit as a starting address. Right, so that will then write out a block of memory. Or possibly either write to or read a block of memory using the same instruction. This one just writes a simple value to uh, a IO channel. Uh, actually, it's right out a value to the I.O. unit as a whole. So this performs an operation. This writes the command from noun, where bits 1 through 16 indicate the data channel. The content of the accumulator is stored at location 7 and then output to the I.O. unit. Right, so this one output the accumulator to a device. This one reads the accumulator from the device. This one just does something. Uh, and this one sets up a DMA system. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a really simple implementation of this that uses these two forms to read and write bytes of text. So output to so let's load a capital A and uh, a 1 in bit 18 and a 0 in bit 17 do it. Do I have the right syntax? Expected a single operand. Okay, let's do this the easy way. Uh, in octal, this is going to be four zero two three four. So again, this has actually stored our values into via the constant pool. Uh, so this instruction loads a constant 65, which is our four one here in the first word. And then this one does the IO action. So that will write out our A. So now we actually have to make this work in the simulator. Uh, so the simulator is obpemu test.image. So 
we should load our constant, which is 101. Which is our capital A. And then we do the IO action which we haven't implemented yet. Okay. BP, BP emu emulator C. Right now an IO instruction is uh one six, so it's this. So we want to we want the top two bits uh, which is four plus two is six o o o o Zero in bit seventeen and eighteen, so this is set up DMA. Uh, zero one is function call. One zero is output A. Now this is slightly weirder than it looks, so we store the accumulator at location 7. And then location 7 is written out to the output device. Uh, and input is stores one word of data at location 7. The content of location 7 is then placed in the accumulator. So that's going to be reg A is get char and this and 7 equals reg A. Right, so that should be fairly straightforward and it doesn't work because this is called memory. So what happens when we run this? Step, step. Hmm. Something should have happened at this point. Okay, this so is step, step. Now So firstly, our program is actually overwriting the interrupt space, or rather the interrupt space overwriting the program, so we're going to have to change the start address. Secondly, it does not appear to have written anything to the appropriate address. Reg A, which is 101 octal, should have gone there. So why hasn't it? So, what is value? Value is the right number. So, do we go into the right... Um, I've missed a zero off here.
Also, I'm an idiot, which doesn't really help. So this should be O, oh, one, two, three, one, two, six zeros plus the octal prefix. Have I mentioned that I hate that octal prefix? So the top two bits is going to be two, uh, four, no, two, zero, one, two, six. There it is. There is our A. Our A. Good. We can now write stuff to the console. This is good. So what are we going to do for our test suite? Let's try testing add. It's going to be dead simple, which is load A with uh, one add on to. Now we want to check to see if the result is three. Now, we haven't done any of the comparison instructions yet, but we can do that with, there should be an is equal to IET. So, if the accumulator is equal to three, then, uh, where is our branch? Then go to uh, then go to uh, this label. Otherwise, we want to tell it, tell the system that it didn't work. Um, Something as simple as that. Uh, it hasn't printed the entire constant pool. The assembler framework only prints the first eight bytes. So this, of course, well, where's the actual? Go. This, of course, won't work. We've loaded one. We've added on two, which gives three. We're now comparing with whatever's at one, two, which fails because you haven't implemented that. So let's implement it. So IET, wherever it's gone, to, got to, is. Four six Now this is a little bit weird because of the or and register stuff. So it does the comparison. Then the result of the comparison is merged into the decision register based on the contents of the OR AND register. And the only thing changed is the decision register.
And in fact, now I think of it, Okay, so if uh, if the or and register is true, then the decision register is ORed with result. Otherwise, the decision register is ANDed with result. So this then becomes do conditional reg a equals the the value at the effective address. Now this brings up another couple of issues, which is that my test suite's not right because the result is going to depend heavily on whether the AND OR register is set to AND or OR and the old value of it. So we're actually going to want to do OR D to set the condition register to OR in and RED to reset the condition register to zero. So this the this instruction will or in the result of the comparison and hopefully give us the right answer. And this of course gives more instructions that we need to implement. So uh ORD, which is what I've called the OR instruction. Actually, let's do RED because it's here. That is 2, 3. Very simple. And we might as well do this one while we're here. this one um, here we go one one and one five so one one is and D F C is uh, F A is true and one five is or D F A equals false. All right, so Or D should set A here, the and or register, to zero, which it is. R E D should set the D register to zero, which it is. This should do the comparison, and the result should be a positive D, which it's not. That should have turned into a capital letter D. So why didn't that work? Because these are backwards. There we go. Capital D, which is a positive result, therefore the BRC will jump. We haven't implemented BRC. Right, BRC is uh, again not complicated. 
Here we go. If the content decision register is zero, nothing happens. If the content decision register is one, content of the storage is placed in the instruction counter. Decision register and or and register are reset to zero. So by default, after every comparison, you get zero. And that is for two. So BRC. So if uh, if reg FD reg PC equals EA Inson reg FD equals reg FA equals false. So you can tell. Remember, this is designed for a, a kind of English language syntax. So this would allows you to say. Uh, if it is five and thing is nine, go to label. This then becomes if it is five, compare a against five and uh, th thing is nine. Go to label. I should put a then in there. Then go to label. Brook label. So it translates almost literally. And after the condition, after the statement is complete, then the decision register and the and or register are reset back to zero. So let's see if this works. Step, 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 step. BRC. And that takes us to the wrong location because I forgot to read the effective address. Uh, BRC then goes to 11, which is halt. You have successfully tested that thing. Uh, so if this fails, and I can make sure it fails by putting one of these in, then if I do this without the debugger, It runs to opcode 11 and stops. Oh, it hit the I.O. instruction. No, it didn't. That is octal. That has, in fact, jumped into the constant pool somewhere. So let's try that again with the uh, debugger. Oh, I forgot to assemble. Right. Now oh, let's try it. Compare. Invert D. See D here turns to lowercase. Try to do the branch. Branch does nothing. Load our letter and write. And it prints an X. OK. So if I try that again without the debugger, that is exactly what we expect. Uh, it uh, prints our X and halts with an error because you haven't implemented halt. Uh, what HALT does is it stops the CPU pending the next interrupt. So that's actually slightly non-trivial to implement until I figured out how I'm going to do interrupts. But we have the beginnings of our test tweet. So we've done a simple addition. Uh, we can move this up to our initialization code because we know that after every check, 
it uh, should reset these. Um, so what else do we want to do? Well, well, all of them, obviously. Uh, in terms of nasty edge cases, let's try an overflow. Uh, so this is going to be three, seven, 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 and one. Now, the result here should be, well, we can actually test this. It should be this. Um, But we also want to check the overflow and uh, we want to check that the overflow bit is set. So there is actually an instruction to do this. Where is it? Where is it? I did see it, uh, I promise. Uh, and or is less than is equal to Right, this doesn't say whether it's signed or unsigned, which isn't so great. Here we go, if overflow tov, which we're going to have to implement. And that's one. Uh, the content of the overflow of the register is one, the test condition is set to one. Right. When it changes the overflow register, the overflow register is reset to zero. Right. So this is actually a simple do conditional with the overflow register, and then we reset the overflow register. And there should actually also be a similar carry. I don't see one. See, I would expect it to be here somewhere. Okay, so Actually, we can do this a cleverer way. So, like this. So, start with this value, which is the largest possible positive number. Add one. Check to make sure it's the right value. So, if it's this, and an overflow happened, succeed. Operators are not instructions. That's an AND D. Okay. So here is our program. So we start at the 
top with ORD, RED, load our maximum possible number, that actually, that's garbage. Why is that garbage? Well, let's see what this does. That did indeed add one to it and then masked off the this, which should never have been there. I think something might be extending when it shouldn't be. Okay, well, let's do the comparison. Now, small d, because that is a false comparison, that's correct. So we do and, which then sets the a bit. Test overflow, which sets the overflow bit, which is not set. So the decision bit should remain zero, which it is. Branch doesn't f doesn't work, so we then print our x. So this isn't working for some reason. Let's take a look at B. Uh, image. So this is our X. That will be add success. Three, two, one is the IO number, the IO value here, followed by another X. So therefore, this is OPA success, which makes this our 04000. This here is a one. And this is this value here. I think the assembler is printing garbage. Chances are So this is working in terms of words, which is right. I don't see any in 16s. There's the Lexa. What's the Lexa doing? That's here. Uh, here is the code that actually parses numbers. which works in terms of words, so that should be correct too. So I think it might be a problem with DW. Okay, so that has printed the uh, all the constants it's seen. So this and this should be one different, and they are not. So what is Uh, 
Uh, I can't remember how to do octal in Lua. It's not that. I can do it on my uh, ancient FX three fifty. Uh, I think the problem is that doesn't appear on the screen. No, I can't. I can do hex. I can't do octal. Let's try a even cheaper calculator. That one doesn't work. It doesn't have any batteries in it. Okay, this is slightly embarrassing. Julia, I know, does octal numbers. I just can't remember how to turn them into decimal. There we go, 131072. Yes, I should have known that. Well, this number here is not this. So that sounds like the assembler has failed to lex this correctly. Oh, oh, I know what the problem is. Did not properly tell it I wanted octal. Because Calgol, the assembler, and C use different syntax. That's better. These are the right values. Okay, so okay, so we've set the A bit for and decision bit is true because we have successfully passed the IET. Now we test with the overflow bit and D is still set. So this works. Good. And eventually it hits the halt and terminates. Uh, let's just add that for simplicity. I'm uh, just thinking the best way to do it. Okay, let's just hack things for now. When it sees a halt instruction, it just terminates. So that has executed a program and finished successfully, which is good. Okay. Um, and we're always going to be adding tests at the top of the file. because um, it makes it easier to step through for debugging them. So load in a negative number, which is this, add a negative uh, Yes, yeah, subtract one. That will become, yep. That will become this, which will overflow. And it succeeds, which is just what we wanted. Now we should also be testing carry, but I'm not sure how to get the carry out. Yes, I I do know how to get the carry out, which is with the ADC instruction. Been really nice if there was a test for carry. I wonder if the advanced processor has that. Uh, 
no it's a test accumulate for odd parity test overflow I don't see a test carry but we can do load a with naught add carry now what should this be uh, it will not propagate a carry so it should be zero over here from three seven 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 to four etc that will not propagate a carry and that fails did we implement ADC yes I did does ADC reset the carry a lot of these things do seem to Your plus carry registers altered overflow carry register overflow register content of the carry register is added to the content of the accumulator if a carry occurs at the input of the 18th bit right otherwise the carry register is reset to zero so this is actually doing a perfectly normal add setting the carry accordingly so that should do the right thing so why didn't that work well So uh, after the add, we've seen that carry is set. If we've gone from here to here. That means the sign bit has changed, but I don't think it propagated carry. I think my logic here is wrong in do add. Because carry is typically a unsigned thing, and overflow is a signed thing. Do I just want to test to see whether the result uh Do I actually want to test to see if the bit above, that is the bit propagated, the one immediately above the 18-bit value, has changed? Because that will have been sign extended here. So we've got no carry, but we have overflown. I think that's correct. So that's successful. I think that's right. So 
So for the carry case, we actually want the highest possible number and we're going to add one to it. And this is then going to be compared to zero, because that's what we expect. Um, and what would overflow be doing in this case? Um, this is the stuff I hate most about doing this. So overflow is meaningless in this case, but it is going to be setting the value to something. So what does the text have to say about overflow? Add. Uh, overflow causes... Overflow can occur when two numbers of the same sign are added, which is true here. Overflow causes the 18th bit of the sum to remain in the sign position and the overflow register to be set to 1. What does the advanced processor say? Because they may have clarified the text. Sub edx add. Overflow can occur if bit, if bit 18 of the sum differs from bit 18 of the operands, the overflow register is set to 1, otherwise it is unchanged. That's better because there's an actual specification. Now, how is it numbering bits? It's numbering bits from 1. Ah, yes, for, here's for the definition of carry. If a carry out of bit 17 occurs, the carry register is set to 1. This is difficult to do in C. But we can do the overflow correctly. And I'm hoping that the OBP specification is the same as the uh, the AOB. ABC? AOP? Advanced Onboard Processor, AOP. They missed a perfect opportunity to call it the ABC. The Advanced Onboard Computer. No, that's not going to work. Okay. If bit 18 of the sum occur, differs from bit 18 of the operands. So... This is left and sign bit is not equal to result and sign bit or right and sign bit is not equal to result and sign bit. Um, can we be cleverer than that, than that? Well, if When two numbers of the same sign are added. Now I'm going to assume that if you try to add two numbers of different signs, the overflow register is not set. So, uh, for these to be the same sign, that's going to be zero. Now we know it's the same sign, so all we have to do is to compare one of those with the sign of the result. I think that is correct. So that does overflow.
However, the sign bits are different. We're adding one. No, we're adding minus one to this. So the sign bit is set in both. Let's make that a bit clearer. Uh, minus one is, no, it's not. That's minus one. That's minus one. Minus one plus minus one is minus two. What was this before? No, it's a. Oh, I'm adding one to it, not minus one. Right, so the sign bits are different, therefore I would not expect the overflow bit to be set. No V flag. And our tests pass. That's because I haven't finished writing the test. Uh, this thinks the carry got set. This thinks the carry is from bit 17. So this is actually ignoring the sign bit. So if there's a carry out of bit 17, then the sign bit is going to be set if it was zero, unset if it was supposed to be one, All right, so I think the simplest way to detect carry with 17 bits is simply do an add of 17 bits and then see whether anything got carried. So that is uh, view left and three seven 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 plus view right and o oh, three seven 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 seven. and check the top bit, and that should give us our carry. So it does think that a carry happened with our first add. Because we are in fact adding 377 Seven 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 with one, which is getting four zero 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 zero. So that's correct. The carry is set. So you want to actually check that. So if it is, if the result is zero, and uh, our code here thought that overflow got set but the ov but our two values had different signs therefore i would not expect that to be the case so with different signs this would end up being 1 so unless overflow was set before which it's not A 
actually, hang on a second, hang on a second. So this is going to produce a zero if they're the same bit. If, they, if the sign bits are the same. So if we then XOR it with the result, if it's the same, no, that wouldn't do anything useful. So left XOR right should produce a zero if the sign bits are the same or a one if they're different. So if they're the same, it's zero. Therefore, we invert it and use a short circuiting comparison. Yeah, that's not right. We actually want to do if left and right and sign bit to say if the sign bits are the same, that is, if they are the same, then do that. Let's try that. Uh, was all right, keep go. And that set the carry, but did not set the overflow, which I believe to be what I expected. So, result is zero. Uh, we want the overflow to be false. That is zero. So, Can we invert the overflow? I don't think we can. We can test the overflow, but we don't want to test for it to be one. We want to test for it to be zero. So let's go to OR mode. Invert the result of our IET unless there is a if not equal to. I don't think there is. No, I don't think there is. So the successful result here is a zero decision flag or in the overflow. So again, the successful result is a zero for the condition flag. And we want the uh, we want to test for the carry being set. So we invert the decision flag again. Now one is the one we want and LDA0, ADC, uh, test for zero. Hang on, we don't need to do this. is why you don't do it like this. Okay, let's change the order of things. 
test for the overflow. Right, so now one is the value we want. So and with the result we want, which is zero, and with LDA zero, ADC, IET zero, uh, and we want the carry to be set, BRC carrying positive add success, Let's try that. So there's our value. Add one to it, get zero. Carry gets set, overflow does not set. Test the overflow flag. No overflow, therefore the decision flag remains zero. Invert and Test the result and test the carry, which is one. Okay. However, something fails further on. Actually, I can do trace one go. Right, and that tells us exactly where it failed, which is program counter 51. And what it was doing, well, let's take a look at the list file. 51 octal, no, that's the line number. Five one octal, but the program counter here is of course in hex. That's less useful than you might think. So we can actually improve this slightly. was the last what was the thing that failed C it failed here overflowing positive add so right load this add one now carry is set which is correct and overflow gets set because the result is too big to fit in a signed 18-bit number. All right, I believe that to be correct. So we check to see whether the result is this, which it is. We check to see whether the overflow bit is set, which it is. And it thinks that the carry is uh, the wrong result. So this should work. That works. Okay, this this is making progress. It's painful, but it's making progress. Uh, let's do a test for shift left. This should actually be easier as it's a much simpler kind of thing. So we've got the top bit set, one, two, one, two, and the bottom bit set. Uh, what's the shift instruction called? Shuf. Shuf. Uh, 
Shift one and what does this do flags wise a lower order six bit blah 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 counts negative is shift to the right if the count is positive the accumulator is shifted left the overflow register is set to one if the sign bit of the accumulator is changed during the shift so the result is going to be uh, the top bit, that 4, is going to go into the overflow bit. And we want to compare the result to 000002. And I believe that's it. Shift right. Now shift right does not do anything with the overflow bit. Hmm. Or is it? Uh, the overflow register is set to one if the sign bit of the accumulator has changed during the shift. Now question is, does this apply to both directions or does it only apply to left shifts? What does the other doc say? Shift. If the count is negative, the accumulator is shifted right. Contents of the accumulator sign bit replacing vacated positions. Oh, right. So when you're shifting right, because it's a sign shift, you are never... Uh, changing the sign bit. So the overflow register will never be set. That's good. So all we're going to do is compare the result with uh, 6 oh, 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 one, oh. Brook SR success. Oh, um, we do want to test the overflow uh, reset overflow reset overflow uh, test overflow invert. We want to make sure the overflow is not set and that's our success. That fails here. Presumably, well, let's try it. Uh, I, I haven't assembled it. That rev is not. Appearing. Shift. Okay, I forgot to mask off the result. Is there a reset overflow? I would expect it to be called rev reset overflow rov yep uh, okay the reason why this is not failing with an error is due to a nasty misdesign in the assembler framework it's not actually the framework's fault it's the syntax I'm using uh, allows you to do that that is a valid label declaration with no colon on the end. 
that means that it can't tell the difference between a unknown label which it needs to set and an, inst an instruction opcode it doesn't know so it hasn't actually so what it's done here is to find a label called rev but without actually producing what we want so that should be rov I think we still need to emulate it as well rov is 07 Let me just check to see whether it's a uh, uh, AOP instruction. At 07, I think it's not 17. 07, Rob. Yeah. Okay, I have implemented that. So what does this do? Right, rov, reset overflow. Shift by one produces this result, no overflow. And okay, so that works. We now sh tested shifts in both directions. So double shift left. Now A is the high bit, so that's going to be four oh 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 one. E is the low bit. That's going to be four oh oh one again. So double shift left by one. Uh, the result we I believe that we want the overflow bit set in fact I don't think that's necessary because the last time we touched the overflow bit should be a tov Uh, where's that double shift? Shifted by double shifted. And yeah, it does do the overflow thing. So double shift left by one. So we wish to, well, first we're going to set the check the overflow bit is set and a the high bit should become the top bit gets shifted off this bit gets shifted left to a 2 the top bit of e doesn't get touched because it's the sign bit so and now we want to get e into a I can't remember whether there is a instruction for doing this. There is in the advanced processor. Uh, let's see what Yeah, it's these exchange instructions. We want uh, exchange accumulator and index, which is 25. But I don't think there is one on this. Yeah, the, uh, the OBP only goes up to 23 octal. So in order to get e, uh, e into A, where we can do stuff with it, we're going to have to write it out to a temporary location, load it back into A, then compare it. Now, the 4 does not get shifted, 
but the one does, so it's going to be that. Double shift left success. Uh, LDA. Uh, I'm getting these letters in entirely the wrong order. But anyway, we've got X, Y, Z. Load this value into A, load the same value into E, shift left by one. That looks like what I want. Actually, we do want to test to make sure that this bit here goes into the top bit there. So that's going to be a three, and that's going to remain a four. Three, four, yep, okay. So overflow is set and that value and store E to the location, load A, yep, compare, yep, and all the tests pass. Good. Double shift right. Two and two. I'm going to use the same values for simplicity. Dish minus one. Uh, Tov CPD and so A is going to be sine extended shift. So four like that and. Uh, S T E temp L D A temp I E T. Now this one is going to go into the top bit of E. Well, there's the bit of E that's just below the sign bit. So one one zero as the top octal digit is going to become O one one. No, it's going to become one O one. But the one here is going to get ordered in, so that's going to be one 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 seven. Like so. BRC double shift right success. Uh you Fails. And shift. Oh yes, I forgot that the, uh, the sign bit gets propagated. Good. How big is our program now? Well, it's going to be painfully inefficient because all these constants are going to get inserted into a massive constant pool. So the actual, let me see, we've got 6, 1 hex times 3 bytes. Right, so this is here. So the constant pool is all of that. And there's a lot of duplicates. We can fix that later. That's just an assembler bug. Okay, that's actually a reasonable number of tests. Oh, we should probably do cycle, which I'm not really... Well, so cycle's fairly easy. Let's do tests for cycle. Cycle right four oh one psych one cycle should set no flags and it's a simple bitwise operation. It works just the way you might think. 
uh, let's like left bits leaving the low order position entering the sign position yep and it doesn't set any flags so that should be easy so compare so the result is going to be that f well like that BRC cycle left success This is the most octal I've ever done in my life. Can't say I'm enjoying it much. Error line one, expected an identifier. Can't even remember the syntax to my own assembler. Undefined symbol IO. <clears throat> Let's do that. Okay. Okay. Cycle right. Da o o same number. Cycle minus one. And this is going to become like this. Yep. Uh, double cycle left. Double cycle is DCY. Yeah, nothing exciting there. So the uh, A, which is in the left hand side, will become uh, 3 and STE temp, LDA temp, IET. Uh, e is going to become 4 is shifted left like that. And double cycle right. Uh, A is going to become six o o o, and E is going to become six o o o. Double cycle right success. That fails. Why does that fail? Okay, that's because I shifted that the wrong way. Interesting, it still fails. Right, shift. Interesting. That is wrong. Where's my double cycle? Here we go. So it's shifting right. That's this one. So amount here is minus one. So thirty-six plus amount is thirty-five, which is two eighteen-bit words minus one. 
So the bottom bit gets shifted left by 35. So I think that bit is being put in the right place, that is, the top bit of A. However, A itself is not getting shifted correctly. So that just should have shifted it right by one. Okay, let's... Well, that is, here is our value. Which is not the right value. Right, I know what happened. It did a 32-bit arithmetic here. Right, now that works. So uh, this had actually failed to put together the 64-bit value correctly by truncating the result to 32 bits. Okay, well, we've now verified that quite a lot of this works. So what instructions are we missing? Here's the instruction table. BRM, that is the branch to subroutine. That sounds like a fun one to implement. So Subroutines on this machine are weird. Uh, let me just think about syntax. So I think this is actually there we go. Uh, the content in the instruction counter plus one is stored at the effective address. Unless that address is protected. Right, so this is basically a store followed by another more interesting thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to write the current program counter. The current program counter has already been incremented into the effective address and then the current program counter becomes the address plus one. That's all you do for a subroutine call. So over in our test suite we need a subroutine. So we're going to implement one down here. Uh, LDA one uh, test suburb. This is the return instruction. Now you notice that there is a DW0 here. This is where the return address gets stored when the subroutine is called. So you call, uh, you, make, you execute the broom instruction, it puts the return address here, 
jumps to here, executes the thing, and then this brew instruction loads the return address from here and jumps to it. So this is going to be a subroutine compare with one says so subroutine should set a to one uh, BOT call subroutine success uh, like this now we do also need to implement uh, brew Brew is six two that's here. And this is very simply that. Now notice this means that you, you can actually call subroutines without needing a stack of any kind which is pretty cool. Uh, let's assemble that. Right, broom217. We should end up at program counter 218. Well, 220, because this is octal. Uh, load1, which is correct. Brew217. And that puts us right back at address four where we should be. Excellent. We've got subroutines. Uh, one, two. XU, EXU, execute. Ooh, this one's exciting. Uh, read EA Insign static void to EXU. This executes an instruction once. And in fact, I've set this up a bit incorrectly. So what we actually want to do is put this here. So well, what this does is it reads a value out of memory and it executes that as if it were an instruction. Where is exu? Content of the storage the effective address is used as the address. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The content of storage at the effective address is the address of the instruction to be executed. The instruction counter is incremented by one unless it is changed by the Wow. That's an extra level of indirection I wasn't expecting. That means my cleverness here is less clever than I thought it was going to be. Anyway, let's do So this is actually going to be this. So two reads. We compute the effective address. We read that to get an address. And then we read it again to get the instruction. So static void do exu insen. Now, if the instruction is itself an EXU, uh, what's an EXU? One, two, and four zeros. Uh, 
do nothing. Otherwise, execute it. Just prototype that. Right, so now for our test suite. Okay, so the assembler will put LDA1 in a constant pool. And LDA1 is the address of that LDA instruction. Okay, so assemble the test suite HLRGT. Right, so load zero. This should do nothing. It has done nothing. Load zero. This should do something. It should set A to 1, which it has. Good. That works. Not entirely sure what this is for, and I suspect neither did the designers, because EXU has been swapped out in the advanced processor for a completely different instruction. So I reckon that they decided it just wasn't very useful. Okay, 2-2. Two, two. We are getting dangerously close to multiply and divide. But not yet. XNGT. If subscript is not greater than noun, set the decision register. XNGT. This is useful for small loops. So this is going to be do conditional if the subscript register is not less than, sorry, is not greater than, so less than or equal to noun, then do the conditional thing with the or and register. Test suite. So, is there an LDX? I think there is an LDX. So we're going to... It's not greater than. Why don't you just call it less than or equal to? So, if X is less than or equal to... 1, and if it is less than or equal to 2, uh, if it is not less than or equal to 3, and let's see, let's see GT success. Uh, 
X is one. Okay, so is not greater than three. As is, is if it is less than or equal to three, yeah, I've got this backwards. So if it is less than or equal to zero which is false, it's a flip. I think that's correct. And that, and that. Good. Two, six. Oh, we've actually, there's two, four in here, which is sub. And it's exactly the same as add, but this is the one I got from the advanced processor. I do believe it's there in the OBP, but I could be wrong. Uh, there's sub. It begins with an S, so it'll be down here. Sub, 2, 4. Subtraction is performed by adding the 2's complement of the contents of storage to the accumulator. The carry is forced into the low order stage of the adder. Um... So this is the same annoying stuff again. Uh, so the carry is forced in. This suggests this is something to do with borrow bits. Well, I can do the simple things. Let me see. Uh, overflow can occur when two numbers of unlike sign are subtracted. So that will be this. Overflow causes uh, the overflow register to be set to 1 and the 18th bit of the difference. I am not convinced I'm understanding how this works. It also doesn't say how overflow is detected. So... So this detects whether they, the two sign bits are different. I think I now need to... Let's just try it and see. To be honest, test suite.
So we are going to subtract 1 from 0. Now I expect the carry bit to be set, the overflow flag to be clear, because nothing has overflown. So overflow flag is clear and the result is minus 1 and LDA0 uh, ADC and the carry bit should be 1 ERC sub positive success Right, so what's this do? Um, I haven't put sub into my disassembler. Anyway, right. So that wraps around which is correct, and due to the right result. Carry is set, overflow is not set. I think that's correct. However, the test fails. Where did D go to zero? It compared against the wrong I thought the result was incorrect um So it's been looking at 273, which is indeed 777777. So also I noticed that this alignment is incorrect, so let's just fix that as well. I'm willing to bet that the value in memory isn't right. Yeah. Uh, now that I don't truncate the value in printing it, I can see that it's all, all garbage. So that will be... That's a uint32. Why would it be sign extending? Uh, two, four, six, eight. Oh wait, that's octal. Right, I know what's happened. It's a bug here. Uh, DW. Uh, this is actually emitting bogus data. Uh, it's like if I look at the image, this will be that minus one constant. Uh, six hex digits is too many to fit 18 bits. This should be uh, anded with the appropriate value, but the assembler can't do that because the, uh, the, uh, the framework doesn't know that it needs to. So instead, what we'll do is we'll just trim here, just to make sure the correct data ends up in the emulator. There we go, now it works. 
so sub negative Uh, we're going to start with minus 1 and subtract minus 1. Now I expect no overflow carry and the result is 0. fails. Why does it fail? Okay. Carry was not set, but a carry clearly got propagated, so the carry detection code is wrong. So uh, if we mask off the sign bits, we get 377777, 377777. No, that's correct. There is no carry because it's just subtracted one value from itself, resulting in zero. No carry got propagated. That's correct. So carry of zero no overflow, right result. Good. Uh, we want to check overflow. So, uh, the smallest value we can represent is this. That's a negative... Uh, that's the most negative value you can get. And we want to subtract minus 1 from it. This gives a value that is too big, not too small. So overflow will be set. The, the correct result is that plus 1, which is... Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yeah, that's not actually testing the right thing. This is the largest possible value. We subtract minus 1, I add 1 to it. That rolls over to this, which is too big. Overflow gets set and a carry gets propagated. Undefined symbols IO. So, what does this do? Uh, no, no carry gets propagated. That's perfectly normal. That overflows, but it doesn't carry. So, that's a zero. Correct. And the V flag did get set. Right. Sub overflow negative. <clears throat> Largest possible value. Subtract one from it. 
leading to three seven 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 no carry overflow Uh, trying to remember which letter comes before L. K. Sub overflow negative success. Like this. So the problem is that uh, some architectures, when you subtract, the carry is treated as a borrow bit rather than the carry bit. And this uh, reverses the behavior. So because I'm writing the test and the emulator based on the same interpretation of the spec, then I could be getting the behavior completely wrong, even though it's passing the test, which is why I wanted uh, someone else's test suite. OK, so. We have this, we've just subtracted one to this. Carry is set, but I don't think it should be. And overflow is set, and I think it is. it should be. So that's not right. So the carry got set because... No, that is correct, because the sign bit isn't included as the carry. So in fact, that's, that's treated as a zero for purposes of cal carry calculation. That's treated as zero, subtracting one, therefore carry is set. That is correct, according to my interpretation of the spec. OK, let's call sub done. It's at least self-consistent. So over for to here again. What's two six? ILT if less than. Now, this is one that I need a bit of uh, they change the name ILT now. And if the content of the accumulator is less than the contents of storage, then conditional. It doesn't say whether it's signed or unsigned, which is important. So that is opcode 26. I think this is test accumulator less than. Uh, accumulator, these are the minors. Test accumulator less, TAL. Contents of the accumulator are less than the contents of the storage at the effective address. Doesn't say. Great. Well, it's either signed or unsigned. I'm going to make the executive decision that it is signed because a lot of the rest of the architecture seems to uh, have a lot to do with uh, signed arithmetic. So that's going to be do conditional sign reg A is less than sign read ea insen and i think that's all there is to it oh yes you need to tell it how big the words are Arguments. Okay. 
test suite. So uh, if a which is minus two, if this is less than four, uh, So two, if this is less than four, which is true. Okay, minus two, if it's less than four, which is true. Yep. Uh, I should probably do a false case as well. Yep, that works. Okay, three, two. Is LDS load scale? That should be simple. Uh, I think that's called SC. SC is the register used to indicate where the decimal point is when doing floating point, when doing fixed point arithmetic using signed, um, using multiplication and division. Uh, let me just see. Let me just find the LDS instruction. Uh, they renamed that one. It's the wrong document. Oh, LDS. There we go. Low order six bits of the content are placed in the scale register. Is it signed? Let me just take a quick look at multiplication and division. Okay. Automatically scaled by arithmetic shifting the accumulator by the number of bit positions indicated by the contents of the scale register. If the contents scale register is negative, the shift is right. If the contents scale register is positive, okay, it is signed. So um, and we also want, is it called STS? Fail register. Going to have to implement those at some point. 
SSA. Content scale register is placed in the low order 6 bits, 0020. So this is SSA reg A equals. Uh, now we want. Six bits, two octal digits, because this says that the high order twelve bits are set to zero. So uh, this LDS effectively sign extends. SSA does not. Test suite. I mean, there's nothing much to this. LDS minus four, SSA. So this is going to be minus four and 577 ERC LDS success. Yay. So what does this do? Loads the scale register. Hmm. That is actually nominally correct, but let's make that uh, let's make that a little bit more elegant. And the SSA puts it back into A seven four. Compare, yes, that works. Four four. Um, I think this is going to be the dreaded mull or div. Yeah, it's mull. Okay, let's do mull. see contents of the content of the accumulator the low order 17 okay it's an 18 bit by 18 bit multiplication res yielding a 36 35 bit uh, result The high order 17 bits and sign of the product go in the accumulator. The low order 17 bits and sign of the project product are retained in the extended accumulator. So both accumulators, both A and E, end up with a sign bit. So yes, 35 bits. The double length product is automatically scaled by arithmetically shifting the accumulator and the 17 bits of the product in the right by shifting the result. The number of bit positions indicated by the contents of the scale register. The sign bit of the extended accumulator is not shifted. The scale register can be positive or negative. The overflow register is set to 1 if the sign bit of the accumulator is changed during the shift. Okay, this does not actually look that bad. Div is going to be a nightmare, but this doesn't look that bad. So, so we're going to sign extend reg. Uh, let's just do this for the right hand side. So this gives us the signed result.
We're now going to shift it. So if it's positive, This is actually this is this code. Um, I think I've got the the shifts wrong. Let me just double check the wording. Here we go. The overflow register is set to 1 if the sign bit of the accumulator is changed during the shift. So it's not whether it's changed between the beginning value and the end value. At any shift position, if the sign bit changes, then we set the overflow bit. OK. So the old sign bit is this. Uh, where's mull? Here it is. Uh, positive scale bit is left. Shift by one if the result sign bit is not equal to the old sign bit, set the overflow bit. For a negative SC, we shift in the other direction. But because it's an arithmetic shift, the sign bit can never change. So now We set reg A to the top part of the result. And we set reg E to the sign bit, which is in reg A. And the bottom. 17 bits of the result. All right. Test suite. So let me see, our scale factor is going to be zero. We are going to multiply. Uh, hang on. 
Now this is going to be a simple low bit, so let's just go by 2 by 3, which should give 6. So the result here is going to be no overflow, no shifts are done, which means the result will be an E, A is going to be 0, STE temp, LDA temp, IET6, simple mull success. And uh, we got up to D, so I've got E, F, and G, and then I have to start with the uppercase letters. Let's see what this does. Right. Right, load the shift register with zero. Two by three is six. No overflow. A is zero. And E is six. That works. Okay, so now I'm going to do a slightly more complicated multiplication. Um, I'm actually going to multiply these two values but in a fixed point fashion. So our scale is going to be, that these are both two and three. The scale is going to be nine bits. Oops, and that should be a mull. So, no overflow should happen. Uh, A should be zero. And E should be that. Okay, so Okay, that's 9 in octal, here are two values, and that has not done what I expected. I think this should be minus 9. Uh, the sign bit is negative and the shift is right, yep. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. to also probably need to do it the other way around. Scaled positive null. Trying to think oops. Trying to think of what this represents. Uh does a positive scale mean? Well, you could use it to get the result into the A register, so let's try that. So this should be 17. So we expect the result to be 6, it's then shifted left 17, which, because the sign bit is not included in E, that should cause the result to end up in A. So, no overflow. A is 6. E is 0.
to there you go and it's done the right thing uh, I should probably think about overflow uh, It occurs to me that according to this specification, overflow only happens during the shift, not during the multiplication. So if the multi... Oh, right. The multiplication itself cannot overflow because the result is 35 bits wide. So we're going to shift left by one. This is going to be uh, we're going to shift left by eighteen. Our values are going to be that. No, because that's negative. That which is positive. And we're going to multiply that by 2, which will shift it left by 1, giving all 4s. No, we're not. We're just going to multiply it by 1. Does nothing, but then the shift should push this off the left uh, and we want to reset overflow okay so the result is overflow should be set and a should be that and E should be zero. Scaled positive overflow mole success. E I O I over. Oops. And I'm also going to need to test uh, negative numbers, but that should be fairly straightforward. So reset v, scale value of 18, which is 2, 1 in hex, load that, multiply. OK, so we have multiplied 2 by 1, and then we've shifted left by 18. Uh, I forgot the sign bit is propagated in the bottom. So that's overflown, but the overflow flag has not been set. I th think I've been slightly too clever there. Let's try that. Uh, still is not set. Okay, so what have we got here? That's our raw result. Uh, 2000 octal multiplied by 1. Old sign is 0. Shift left by 1. Um, um, a 
Okay, so this is going to shift by 18 bits. So. So you can see the result getting bigger. So, because this is 35 bits, so that's 12 octal digits. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Right, that, that 2 is actually in the sign bit. Uh, I think these are wrong. I think that wants to be like that. Okay, that's better. So it's now set the sign bit. Our results are how we would expect them to be. Good. And we should probably do a uh, mixed sign just to make sure this works. So this should be minus 6. Overflow should not have been set. A should be that and SDE temp and temp. This should be minus 6. Okay, we've now run out of letters, so let's start with the capitals. Good. Okay, I think Mull works. That wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be, to be honest. Okay, uh, I think the next one, yeah, the next one is going to be div. So I think I will actually Again, I am slowly running out of time. I thought I was going to be done with this in a single session. So I'm not going to get stuck in with div. So let's have a look at some of the other smaller operations. OK. This one I can do. Not. Does nothing. I'm not even going to bother testing it. IGZ. Uh, if the accumulator is greater than zero, I think. Here we go. IGZ. Uh, if is positive. If the sign position bit 18 of the accumulator contains a zero test condition is set to one okay so do conditional uh, 
reg a and sign bit. The accumulator contains a zero. So this will be false. And LDA one IGZ BRC IGZ success. Okay, next is five, if parity odd. If the number of ones in the 18-bit accumulator is odd, then the test condition is set to one. Now, I think there's a standard function for counting the number of bits. There's uh, there's FFB FFB Here we go FFS find first set bit in word Yeah, I thought there'd be a reference here to the count, but there isn't. Okay, so this is just going to be if if the number of ones is odd. Simple enough. Test suite. So this is odd. And actually, let's go the other way. This is even. And LDA one. IOP, BRC, IOP success, BRC. Okay. <laughs> two, of course, has one set bit. That has two set bits. Yep, 
that works. Okay, one, two. Uh, set page, LDP. Contents of bit 13 through 16 of the accumulator are placed in the page register. to think how many bits I need to shift for that because they're using weird counts so it's these four bits uh, oh yeah uh, 12 tricky thing here is testing because as soon as I change the page register then I lose access to all my variables and the constant pool um, and there also should be a set from page register Maybe there isn't. Uh, so one reason why everything is indirected through memory is to allow you to refer to an 18-bit address with only four octal digits. Well, a 16-bit address. The idea is that uh, different programs would be linked into different pages and the whole lot loaded as a single binary image they can refer to each other by simply updating the address in memory while not touching any of the code. The code is relocatable between pages. So how am I going to test this? Um, Each page is uh, 12 bits so 4k pages how big is our image not big so we should just be able to do uh, so that's not done what I wanted. See, I was expecting to see lots of padding at the bottom. Yes, uh, org doesn't actually emit padding. Uh, org just changes what the system thinks is the current program counter. I know what I can do. So go to page one. load a value 
go to page one, store it at address zero, go to page zero, Can I load that? No, I've run out of bits, but what I can do is load that, because that goes via a constant pool. And I'm allowed to use constant pools because P is, is 0. Uh, LDX4096, that then allows me to do 0, comma X. And then this should be 1, 2, 3, 4. So what we've done is we've used the page registers to store 1, 2, 3, 4, then we've read it back using a direct memory reference and checking to make sure it's the right thing. P success. Okay. D I O I O R Alt P success. Ten syntax error. What's wrong with that? Unless it's complaining about that. It's just got the wrong line number. Nope, it doesn't doesn't like LDP. Ah, LDP is a simple contents of bits 13 through 16 of the accumulator are placed in the page register. Right. So what we're actually going to do is load that into E. LDA1, LDP. Store E. LDA0, LDP. And that allows us to load our to do our right. Okay, that's assembled. LDE one two three four, which is now there. Load Z, load one. Uh, that didn't change the page register because that is uh, the page register is loaded from the top four bits of the bottom 16 bits of the register, i.e. it's an address. It just pulls the top four bits of the address out. Okay, right, P is now 1. That should store the right value. Oh, 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 I can't do that. That's a constant pool reference. How can I get a zero without referring to a constant pool? Uh, well, we've got one... Hmm. Yeah, like that. That's vile, but it sh should work. So it's set page register, store E, load A with the value we wanted, subtract it from itself, which gives zero, load P, okay. Load X with our address, dereference, Woohoo, we got the right value. And let's just check. Yep, and our value here uh, at real address zero hasn't changed. And if I do this, you can see here is our 2322 value. Right, LDP works. One six, what's one six? Uh, that's more I.O. Wait. No, that's the main address. That's the 
the noun form. Uh, what's a 1, 6 in the simple instruction form? Uh, two, two, one, three, one, four, one, zero, no, six. Really? Exit. Okay, exit is interesting. Exit does a system call. Uh, what this does is it fakes an interrupt. Uh, interrupts work by the system uh, saving the current state of the CPU at a particular memory address, which varies depending on interrupt, and then it will load the new state from a slightly different area. Uh, so this is actually something so we're actually just going to queue the interrupt it's interrupt number 6 Dean, but uh, yes, this calls it in sixteen as well. So let's just Q interrupt sixteen. And for now, we're just not going to do anything. We're going to deal with that later, after div. Uh, two, one is IEZ, which I believe is if equal to zero. Yep. So let's do conditional reg A equals zero. And that's all the simple instructions. Complex instructions. We have three remaining. We got six four, which is div, six six, which is IGT, and IGT is going to be the same as ILT, but the other way around. So I'm just going to copy that code. Seven two is tin, which is return from interrupt. There we go, resume. Content of the storage at the effective address is used as the starting address of an interrupt storage area. Uh, this document doesn't mention interrupt storage areas, but it, it mentions them, it doesn't define them. This document does define them. I'm going to assume that the format hasn't changed. And here it is. So there are 16 interrupts from 0, well, 17 interrupts from 0 to 16. Uh, each one is defined, each one has this block of 8 words. When an interrupt occurs, it writes the state into these four words, and then it reads the state from these four words. And the TIN instruction reads the state from the first four words. So, uh, this is just going to be, use TIN to return from a interrupt. 
Now, let me check the wording. The content of storage at the effective address is used as the starting address of an interrupt storage area. So it's that double indirection thing. Uh, uint32 address. And let's just do face all no execute interrupt. Okay. So emulator interrupt is going to have to check the various uh, priority and lockout registers to see whether we can actually handle the interrupt. Uh, if so, we uh, calculate the address of the interrupt block. We write the state to it, and then we will call do tin to read the state that we want to go to. So there's actually very little code in the interrupt thing. This is an amazingly simple machine. And that would be it. That's like nearly done. Okay, so Oh, yes, uh, I should probably uh, I should probably test the instructions I just added, but none of them are interesting. They're just copies of other instructions with slightly different state, so I can't be bothered. So let me just commit that. probably call it for today. See you very shortly. Okay, let's finish this off. There are only two more things to do, but they are quite big things, which is the divide instruction, which goes here, and the, uh, the interrupt handling, which is these two routines here. Uh, I, there's also some bug fixing that needs doing because the shift and cycle, uh, actually just the shift operations, aren't correctly calculating the overflow register. Uh, and we also need to do a little bit of arrangement of the startup sequence. I did some reading up. I found this nice description of the interrupt system in the AOP documentation. The way this CPU works is there are 17 possible interrupts, numbered 0 to 16. Interrupt 0 is the one used to start the system up. Interrupt 16 is the one used as the system call, the one that the exit instruction, which is here, invokes. The reason why it's called exit is this machine is supposed to run a time-sharing executive kernel, which uh, schedules between multiple different tasks at different priorities. And uh, when a task terminates, it will call exit to return back to the uh, kernel. Uh, this may actually also be used for descheduling as well if it's cooperative as the uh, the memory protection register only ever gets loaded from uh, an interrupt description block then this will allow the uh, the scheduler can 
set the appropriate memory protection for the task that it's running and then the exit routine because it invokes an interrupt will then reload the memory protection register for the scheduler. So the way interrupts work is there are 17 of these blocks that uh, live in memory from 0 to 200 octal and when the system starts up it will invoke uh, it will set the registers to what's in this half of the block that is uh, when the interrupt occurs this is where they're loaded from which indicates interrupt priority content of page D overflow and carry the memory protection register and the program counter note that it doesn't contain S, E, or X, uh, or the scale register. Now, I am assuming that the OBPs behave the same way as the AOP, but uh, I think that is plausible. So, we're going to need a interrupt priority register which is uh, 15 bits wide because this doesn't include interrupt 0 and it doesn't include interrupt 16 is that correct I wish they're number bits from 0 it makes them so hard to understand so this is actually 0 to 15, which is 16 interrupts. So I actually, I think that this one does correspond to the exit interrupt, which means that if you call exit when interrupts are blocked, it just queues the interrupt and continues execution. I think that seems odd, but there you go. Okay, so uh, let's add a interrupt priority register. 16 bits wide. Let's call that I. So our tin instruction, tin loads the execution state from a block it's used to return from an interrupt. You point it at the the old values which are saved when the interrupt happens and it reloads them and continues. Uh, so this is pretty straightforward. Uh, I wonder what happens if... I just want to check something because I believe this should ignore the memory protection register and the uh, ticks tie top where's tin oh they renamed it for the AOP uh, let me see I believe this instruction should ignore the memory protection register and the page register. Here we go. Resume from interrupt called Tim. Really? Tim with an M? Okay. Uh, content authority effective address is used as the starting address for a forward save register. That suggests that the page register is used, otherwise they wouldn't be talking about effective address. And uh, the memory protection register presumably... Oh, this, this is a read, so the memory protection register is not invoked. Okay. That's sensible enough. Where's that table? All right.
read i. Uh, read sl from and read the program counter from here. And I just realized that there's a bug. This should be because it is not, the previous code was not honoring the page register. Um, okay, we need to pull these fields out. So the page register is 4 bits starting at bit 12 because of the peculiar number. P equals uh, however these are flags so that is I and one Shift six overflow is I and one shift seven. D is nine. Uh, so I believe that this one would be where the and or register goes, which is not saved. Okay, so that should be correct. So on startup, therefore, do we need to prototype this because we're about to call it on startup to do the appropriate things? Um, that wants to be zero. And do tin four, I believe. Uh, the overflow register is called V, and it needs a semicolon. And this is reg PC. Okay, right now our test suite. So we are going to So this is the header at the beginning of code which is these four uh unused vectors followed by the new interrupt priority we have to figure out how the interrupt priority works uh Page D overflow and carry is zero. Storage limit register is. What did I set that to? That. And. Then we want the address at which to start execution. Okay. So we assemble and run it. And we see we have uh, SL is set correctly, program counter is set correctly here at the ORD instruction. So we should be able to run it. There we go. We can now return from interrupts. We now need to take interrupt. Also, I'm actually going to do a bit of poking around. Now, the documentation for the I.O. instruction 
in the OBP stuff. If I can find it. Here it is. It says that uh, it outputs the content of the accumulator with the content accumulator is stored at location seven, which is here. So once you've overwritten that, how are you supposed to restart the system? I am not actually terribly sure about that. I'm wondering if it's one of the things that they may have changed in the uh, with the OAP, AOP, which means that the, the assumption I'm making, which is the interrupt system works the same way in both systems, may not actually be valid. Try to find the IO instruction, which I think they've renamed. Um, so the IO instruction is so the IOP instruction no it's not the IO instruction octal 16 so let's look for that Here we go. Output two. Yeah, they've changed this completely. This is totally different logic. So uh, I have a bit of a suspicion that the OBP and the AOP start execution in different places. There's some stuff here about linking programs together. But I think it's assuming uh, that the that there is a loader on the system which is supposed to start things that contain the uh, the executive. Now this is IO. Interrupt. So fifteen bit register for the OBP. Uh, what does it say about? Interrupt one has top priority. This interrupt will be used to initiate program execution. Okay, that is different from the AOP. Right, that makes sense. So, So this is interrupt one, this is interrupt zero, which is unused on the OBP. That means that the IO stuff actually writes to this address. Uh, this one is, is address seven. So we are actually going to want to change our startup code to execute the appropriate routine. Let's try that. Okay, that has worked. We are in the right place. Our test suite runs. All right, now, 
Uh, there is a 15-bit register in the I.O. unit which stores interrupt requests. And there is another 15-bit register which is the interrupt priority register. So let's change this to IRQ and IRQP. So the priority register gets loaded from the data block. So when an interrupt happens, we want to queue the interrupt like this. But I don't actually think we want to do anything else at this point. If uh, an interrupt is queued when an interrupt is already p present, I believe it gets lost. An interrupt is sent to the CPU when the request bit is set from the hardware and the corresponding bit of the interrupt priority register is zero. Should two allowable interrupts simultaneously request interrupts, yeah, uh, that indicates the order in which they are handled. The interrupt priority register is set when an interrupt is sent from the I.O. unit to the CPU, or when CPU executes exit, when the CPU executes resume. The one exception is interrupt one has top priority and cannot be locked out. Um, as each request is serviced, the corresponding bit in the register will be reset. Okay, so an interrupt happens, we set this bit, Then when we service interrupts, we reset that bit. So the interrupt priority register is set when an interrupt is sent from the I.O. unit to the CPU. Why would that update the interrupt priority register? Surely the interrupt priority register will be... Oh, right. Uh, this is talking about when the interrupt is handled and we read the interrupt. Uh, we read the new value of the register from... Uh, from the data block that happened that happens here okay so I think we now have enough data to be able to handle interrupts and that is going to happen here just before we process any before we process each instruction so we want to scan our interrupts. Interrupt 1 is the highest priority. The interrupt priority register is how you enable and disable particular interrupts. Okay, we, we need to scan the interrupt bit starting at interrupt 2. Okay, uh, the interrupt numbers used by the documentation are start at 1 and go up to 16. The interrupt numbers in the, in the bits, however, 
interrupt one is going to go into bit one according to the documentation, which is bit zero according to everybody else. So hence the minus one there. So remember it is 15 bits wide. So if If there is an interrupt pending, and the interrupt priority register is, uh, allows us to take that interrupt, you know, the corresponding bit of the interrupt priority register is zero. So that's actually a not there. Then we take the interrupt. We reset the appropriate bit. In the IRQ flag to indicate that we have taken it. And we We use, okay, we do not wish to do this here. We wish to do this here. That is before we read the actual instruction. And of course, um, we need to save the old state. So this is going to be So interrupt one, which is i equals zero, goes into octal one zero. And this code, this line, will actually context switch to the interrupt handler. So now we need to save the contents of our interrupt. So don't want to use the WR instruction because we are ignoring the memory protection register. So we are just going to write Uh, the the old value of IRQP the old value of the memory location register the old program counter and this is going to be value of the status bits like that. So I think I think that's right. So how are we going to test this? Well, we can't actually provoke interrupts. Except, I mean, we can't provoke real interrupt, but we can provoke uh, a system call. So 
So this is uh, interrupt priority zero, in, that means interrupts are on. Uh, flags word is zero. Uh, memory protection word, global access. And the actual entry point is the system call, which we're going to put down here. And we need to save our state. SDA, save A, SDE, save D, STX, saved X. We also need to save the scale register. Which is SSA Actually this is a system call not an order and not a normal interrupt so that we don't have to save everything but uh, let's just try that Well, we then do the work, and then we have to reload everything back again. So load the scale register, load X, load E, load A, and in order to return from the register, we do... That. Let me check the wording for tin. Content of the storage at the effective address is used as the starting address of an interrupt storage area. So it wants to be that. And I think that should work. So we should just be able to do exit. I will actually set the registers. So now we want to compare these so that A should be 1. Uh, and temp, LDA temp. And E should be two and temp LDA temp and uh, X should be three. The thing is if X it doesn't actually do anything, then it won't change any of the registers. Honestly, that's good enough. Okay, and now what happens when we run this? Right, board red. Uh, load A with one. Load E with two. Load X with three. That didn't do anything. but the test will still pass because uh, it didn't do anything. Uh, yes, actually, we do need to make this a bit 
more intelligent. Let's uh, have our system call uh, add one to a um, subtract one from x and leave e as is. So add one to a, a should be two. E is as is, subtract one from x, that should be two. Right, so it, it has definitely not run any code because our registers are unchanged. So this suggests there is something wrong here. Uh, we should print the interrupt bits. Um, uh, 15 octal bits is Five. Uh, Fifteen bits is five octal digits. Which is too big. That's a shame. Don't think there's any way in which I can get more space, sadly. Okay, so run exit that. Have I set the right bit? Yeah, I think I have not set the right bit. So that should have set... That was IRQ 16. So that should have set the 15th bit so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, 16 so that should have done one shifted left by 15 So this is actually scanning bits one to six, uh, scanning interrupts one to 16. Let's actually make this a bit clearer.
All right, so do um, break emulator interrupt. Okay. Interesting. I can't type into the debug into the debugger window. Well, okay, we're here. So I just managed to completely fail to do mental arithmetic. I have a slight touch of the numeric equivalent of dyslexia, which makes arithmetic rather difficult. Um, so if IRQ was 1, we want to set the bottom bit. So 1 minus 1 is 0, 1 shift to left 0 is 1. So 3, 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Right, okay. I am just completely failing to uh, count correctly. That is setting the right interrupt bit. So why is it not detected? So it should have spotted that this bit is set and spotted that this bit is clear in the uh, priority mask, so taken the interrupt. So this is it scanning the interrupt bits. Ah, right. We've done the scan before the we've executed the instruction. This means that our execute happens. Our, our exit happens. It goes round and hits the debugger before it's scanned for the next interrupt. So if we do it this way round, then it should take the interrupt. There we go. Yeah, that would add the old logic. It would have worked, but the 
debugger was being invoked before the interrupt was being processed, so it was displaying the wrong instruction. This is clearer. All right, now what does this do? We should now be down in our interrupt handler here. So we add on one to A, we subtract one from X. That doesn't do what I want. We don't have a test for X yet, or for ADX. Uh, but we then call tin, which should put us back at instruction 216 which it is. And the test fails because that's a good point. Why does the test fail? I actually forgot to put the uh, failure case here. So that should actually output E doesn't. So that should fix ADX. Yes. And we jump back to here. So we compare against two. Uh, And now we are doing the LDP, which now passes. OK, that's good. We have uh, exit working. And we should also have, as a corollary of this, general interrupts working. So we do want a quick test for LDX, for ADX. I forgot to assemble it. Right, STX into that address, load into A. Good. And there aren't any flags to deal with, so that should be straightforward. All right, the last one. Div. Oh boy. So. Hardware divide on these early machines, it doesn't quite do what you think it might. Apart from anything else, this has got the automatic scaling, which is annoying. Uh, so the content of the accumulator and extended accumulator are automatically scaled by shifting the number of bits in the scale register. If the content of the scale register is negative, the shift is left. So up here content of the scale register is negative, the shift is right. So this is the reverse. The shift is left for the shift is left with zeros filling yeah 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 yeah. If the sign bit of the accumulator is changing the shift the overflow register is set to one. If 
content of the scale register is positive, the shift is to the right, and the sign fills positions. All right. So let's do a couple of helpers. Okay, so this wants to be left shift uh, result equals left shift result reg SC else result equals right shift result minus reg SC. So it's static void do div. Scaled accumulator and expanded accumulator form the dividend, which is divided by the content of storage of the effective address. So we want to read the right hand side of the expression and do the divide. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is to compute the left-hand side, which is uh, the which is, uh, that should be reg A, reg A shifted left by 17, ord with reg E with the sign bit chopped out. Right, so If the scale register is positive, the shift is to the right. Oh, yes, and also we need to sign extend to 35 bits. If reg sc is negative, shift left. Okay, now we want to do the division. So that should be the left hand side divided by the sine extended right hand side.
the overflow register is set if the content of the accumulator that is the result the result is greater than or equal to the content of storage So if we divide 3 by 2 with no shift, uh, so for th in this situation, accumulator is 0 and extended accumulator is 3 to form the simple integer 3. Divided by 2 gives 1. Right, this is referring to the actual accumulator after the shift has happened, that is the top 18 bits of our 35-bit value. So, if Uh, the overflow register is set if the content of the accumulator is greater than or equal to the content of storage. If LHS 17 is greater than or equal to the contents of storage, uh, set FB. Otherwise, we do the okay let's uh, just do this So this gives us the quotient and the remainder. The signed quotient goes in the accumulator. The signed remainder goes in reg E. So in fact, we should just be able to do reg A, reg E. Now, the remainder has the same sign as the dividend and has a magnitude less than the divisor. I can't remember what C does with quotients, but let's go with that. Uh, Expected identifier before numeric constant. All right, so that should be our div instruction. Let's try it out. So we're going to divide three by two. So LDA zero, LDE three div 2. Now we want the overflow flag to be set, uh, to be clear, so get overflow and invert it, and we want the quotient to be 1, and we want the remainder to be 1 as well. Okay. So A is zero, 
e is 3, do the divide, woohoo, 1, 1 and no overflow. Good. Um, I just realised I did remember, did forget to set the scale register, but luckily it was 0 anyway. Uh, we are going to divide um, we're doing the same thing except with a 17-bit scale we expect overflow to be clear I expect A to contain 1, in fact we should get exactly the same results as before. divide and we get nothing. Um, I think I've used the wrong direction. No, no I did get, I did have the right one. Positive scale causes div to shift the left hand side right. Interesting. Why didn't? Why is that zero? So a is three. That should be shifted left. I have have not got the right type for my sign. This should be easy. In fact, that would be cheaper if it was a macro. Never mind. Well, it's still not working. That is our A shift left. I think my sign extension is still broken for 64 bit values. It is.
There we go. One, one, and no overflow. Good. And we also want to check in the other direction. This will shift left. Uh, on, negative div. Cont uh, Contest is negative. The shift is left. So if we shift by one, So this will get turned into a 6 divided by 2 should be 3 remainder 0 with no overflow. A will be 3. If the accumulator is 0, do mm, not what I was expecting that's because that should be negative there we go Quotient three, remainder zero, no overflow. Good. Uh, we should check signs. Uh, minus three. This one divided by two should yield. Um, minus one as the quotient with no overflow. I think no overflow. The content of the accumulator is greater than or equal to the amount in storage. Accumulator is minus three. Okay, that's the right way around. So no overflow and the result should be minus one and uh, the remainder should be same sign as the dividend Uh, the dividend is the right hand side, so the, the remainder should be one. Okay, now what's this doing? Well, for a start, these values are kind of garbled, but I can see that the remainder here is minus one, which isn't what we wanted. And that number is just wrong.
Hmm. The result here is minus infinity. Well, minus uh, um, int min for this representation. When that should be one, and the remainder is minus one, which is wrong. So, well, these numbers are wrong for a start. That should be that way around. Okay, minus one, minus one. That should be minus one, one. So we need to adjust this. Back in the basic days, there was a standard function called sine that returned the sine of a value. Uh, so either uh, 1 or minus 1, depending. And it was really useful for this sort of thing. We've got copy sine, but I'm not sure that does the same thing. Uh, these functions return a value whose absolute value matches that of x, but the sign matches that of y. That is actually kind of what we want. But this is all floating point. What does sign bit do? Generic macro returns on all real floating point types. Turns a non-zero value, the value of x is its sign bit set, which is also not quite what I want. Okay, well, if the remainder is negative and the right hand side is positive, and flip the sign. Um, we want to flip the sign of the remainder if the sign of the remainder and the sign of the right hand side are different. So if the remainder is negative, it's not equal to the right hand side is negative then we flip the sign. All right, so we have minus one for the quotient and one for the remainder, which is, I believe, what we want. Okay, and while I remember, let's shunt this, these helper functions up above here. Uh, so if you want to right shift it, here's double shift. So because we now have the helper function, we might as well use it. And now something fails. Um, 
That was test Z. What is Z? Shift left. So we're using a negative shift. Hang on. Z it was shift left. Okay, we're using a positive shift value to mean go left. I bet the overflow is set. The overflow register is set to 1 if the sign bit of the accumulator has changed during the shift. Is that the same as the shifts we're doing here? If the sign bit of the accumulator has changed during the shift, the overflow register is set to 1. So that's not the sign bit because the sign bit changes depending on how big the thing we're shifting is. Okay, so left shift 35. can't use the same function for both of these. So if you want to shift this, we have to do that. Right, and now that passes. Um, okay, I think we're probably good. I'm sure there are edge cases here that aren't tested correctly. Honestly, until I can find the original test suite that was used to verify the real machine, then I don't really think there's any point uh, working on this more. It is producing what seems to be the right result based on my interpretation of the text but the test suite will be authoritative. So, uh, oh yeah, there was one more thing I wanted to do, which was that I changed the syntax of the uh, of the assembly. So let's just update the disassembler to match. Is this going to work? D, find, double quote, close enough.
So then this needs to be uh, the opcode followed by, it's always going to be square bracket form because the actual value will depend, uh, the value form only exists in the assembler followed by a address followed by a comma x suffix so opcode followed by this uh, followed by that that's not working why isn't that working expected a length still not working double quote here all right that's better that looks like Sensible syntax. And in fact, if I do unassemble, here is the internal disassembly. You can see just, ah, here we are actually using the comma X form to dereference a pointer. All right, so there's more stuff that can be tested. I've missed a number of opcodes, but honestly, I think that's pretty good. Oh uh, yeah, there is uh, one thing which is We hacked this, remember? So we actually only want to execute instructions if the CPU is not halted. So if we have executed a halt instruction, we just keep spinning on the same address without actually processing the instruction, waiting for an interrupt to happen. So do tin here needs to unset the halted flag. And I believe that's finished. So this is the OBP. It's only what? 880 lines of code, that's quite impressive. Not terribly good code, I'm sure this could be optimized more. Uh, oh yes, we haven't done this one. We can't set registers yet. So... Value is store null eight. That that actually parses the value. So PC is just finish off the debugger. memory protection register page register uh, 
uh, IRQ register, IRQP, uh, now the flags, so that's D, V, A, X. Hang on, there isn't an X. What am I thinking of? Carry. So, program counter. AEX, uh, SCSLP, the two IOQs and the flags. So we should be able to say set carry to one. Doesn't work. Why can't we do that? Because I didn't enable it in the debugger core. All right, set carry to one, carry is one. Set V to one, yep. V to zero, PC is 4,000 in octal, yep. Okay, that's good. All right, I'm gonna call that done. We now have a relatively complete simulator, complete with a basic debugger. We haven't used breakpoints or watch points yet, but they should be supported. For the 1968 era uh, onboard processor, as used by a bunch of spacecraft, including the uh, orbiting astronomical observatory. It should be really easy to adapt this to simulate the AOP, the advanced processor, the one described in this document. It's got more opcodes and I think a slightly more sensible layout. This is from when is this from 1973? Uh, I don't know anything about the NSSC-1, the NASA Spaceflight Standard Computer, as used by the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, if anyone actually knows any, if knows where to get any technical specs, I'd love to get my hands on them and actually do a simulator for it. Uh, but it's probably not very different from this. Uh, all you really need now is a actual spacecraft to put it in, but uh, that's possibly a little bit beyond my abilities to implement. That is now obsolete. Uh, I would particularly love to get my hands on any original source code, including that diagnostics tool. Uh, I will have to to modify it to make it work with the uh, this Calgol assembler. Uh, this assembler is very much a quick hack. It doesn't have any of the linker or paging abilities, so you're in real life you're going to be limited to writing 4K words of code. But uh, I don't believe there are any other assemblers for it currently, so I still come out ahead. It'd be really nice to know whether my simulator w works with real source code. Uh, this is all fairly dependencyless C, so it should be possible to rip this out and use it in something else. Um, I know the AGC simulator is used by the Orbiter Spaceflight Simulator so that you can land a lem on the moon using the original software in the onboard computer, running in an emulated onboard computer. It would be rather cool to do this for other spacecraft as well, which use the OBP or AOP. Uh, so that is basically it. I'm just going to check this in.
and push it so that uh, I can't claim I didn't do it. Done. Uh, so I will write up a. I will put put together a README with some uh, references and do a blog post. But this is all now on GitHub for people to play with. Please play with it, and let me know what you think. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please let know me. Ah, please let me know what you think in the comments.